Okay. Uh, so welcome everybody to the December 2021 uh, MTT SCV virtual talk, uh, the technical presentation. This is the last technical presentation for 2021. Uh, and uh, Today, we are very fortunate to have with us Dr. Hua Wang, who is the full professor and chair of electronics at ETH Zurich. Before that, he had a very distinguished career at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, so uh, the title of today's talk uh, is Fundamentals of RF and Millimeter Wave Power Amplifier Design. Uh, welcome, Professor, and thank you for agreeing to do this talk. Uh, we will look at a few slides before uh, look at the agenda for today. Go to the meeting notes, uh, COVID-19 update. Uh, we just had the elections for the chapter officers. We have the results of those. Uh, so we look at the transition uh, happening uh, as we head into next year. Uh, some slides about the RFIC symposium. And uh, also uh, we have finally managed to set up our YouTube channel. We have all of our recorded talks on there and we'll look at that. And uh, after that, we'll go on to uh, the details of today's talk, and we'll have Q&A throughout. Uh, so uh, to take on the next couple of slides, I'd like to call upon uh, Tom McKay, who is our vice chair. So Tom. Thank you, Akarsh, and welcome everyone. Um, a few things to note, this meeting is being recorded and being uh, on, on live on Zoom. Um, the links, to the recorded video and slides will be sent to all registrants. Uh, look for that in a couple of days from now. Um, please please uh, keep your cameras off and microphones muted. Um, we're gonna use the raise hand reaction button uh, on Zoom for um, during the Q&A period. And then the host will unmute you so you can ask your question uh, verbally. Um, Again, uh, if you could ensure that your display name in Zoom matches the one you use to register, uh, it simplifies check-in. So thank you for that. Next slide. Uh, the COVID pandemic um, is requiring that all in-person meetings related to the chapter are canceled. Um, Monthly technical meetings and officer meetings will continue in an online and webinar format only until further notice. Uh, the uh, officers um, are shown on this slide. Uh, we are the Santa Clara Valley San Francisco chapter of the MTT Society um, of the IEEE. Um, Atkarsh Krishna is the 2021 chair um, in 2022, uh, Tom McKay, that's myself, will be chair. Uh, we just finished the election. Um, and then uh, uh, Venkata Gade will become vice chair in 2022. Um, Tan Tu will uh, continue as treasurer. And we will uh, be adding Darren Phelps, uh, longtime Silicon Valley um, microwave uh, professional. Uh, to our team, um, and uh, yeah, we're also looking for volunteers for things like uh, webmaster and that sort of thing. So if you're interested, um, you can um, uh, reply to uh, Utkarsh's uh, email. Next slide. So uh, just want to take this opportunity to uh, congratulate uh, all the officers for next year on uh, their election and. Uh, also, I don't know if Darren's on the call, but uh, congratulations, Darren. And Darren uh, has been an officer of the chapter in the past, so uh, the chapter will be in very good hands. Uh, so congratulations, guys, and uh, we hope you continue all the good work that we've been doing here. So, yeah. uh, Akarsh, uh, you've done a tremendous job. I um, was commenting to Jay uh, on, on the phone uh, earlier that, um, you know, you've really, um, brought the chapter back to life. I really, really have been uh, inspired by your leadership. Thank you so much. Oh, so. thank you for your kind words, Tom. <laughs> but, but it's a group effort. We all did it together through some very difficult times. So uh, yeah, it's been a good, good run. 
Okay, uh, so you want to talk a bit about the RFIC symposium? Yes, um, RFIC, uh, uh, we're going to have a wonderful uh, conference uh, joint with the IMS in Denver, Colorado, the uh, 19th, uh, well, the, the week of the 19th uh, of June and, and 2022. You still have time to submit your paper um, for RFIC. The deadline is January 16th. Thanks, Akash. Okay, uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, I'll talk a bit about this slide here. Uh, just a screenshot of our YouTube channel, the name of which is uh, IEEE space MTT-SCV. Uh, I have uploaded all the, it's a total of, I think, 16 uh, videos uh, so far from last year and this year. Uh, today's will be the number 17. Uh, so far, we've been uploading to the MTTS Facebook page and sending out the links to everybody. We'll keep doing that for the near future because we see a lot of traffic there. Uh, but this uh, channel is a dedicated channel for MTTS CV. Uh, so all our talks will be available. This will be like a one-stop shop for all the talks that we have done. I've organized everything into playlists based on years and topics. And uh, so I'll be sending out the links to this channel as well. Uh, when I do the post event engagement email with the links to the video. So uh, everybody should receive this one. So you can go here, you can see all our talks listed. So, and we'll be loading all our future talks on here as well. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Venkara, you wanna take this slide, uh, just explain some of the benefits for those who are not familiar. Yeah, sure. All right, hi everyone. Um, so uh, this slide uh, gives the links of, of the IEEE and MTTS chapter um, society. So please do become a member of IEEE and support the um, IEEE and various chapters and, and all the good work uh, put, to, to, put together by all the engineering and uh, technical prof professions in IEEE. So please do join IEEE and MTTS and there is a LinkedIn hashtag MTTS CV for our chapter. So please do um, uh, subscribe. Thank you. Thank you, Venkara. So uh, before we go on to the details of the talk, I just wanted to mention like these are the details of today's talk. Usually we don't give out this information, but I think uh, just wanted to mention how remarkable uh, the response to this event has been. We have seen like at close, we've seen like uh, 1,143 registrants uh, from uh, all seven continents, like all six continents, inhabited continents. Uh, and uh, record-breaking registrations from the US, uh, India. Uh, and I can give you some more details. Like in California, we had more than like, close to 270 registrants. And in the North Bay area, which is our kind of core area of operation, we had uh, around 150 registered. And uh, already I can see there's like 238, uh, 239, <laughs> 240 folks on the call. Number just keeps going up. Uh, so this is like a record-breaking uh, event in terms of registration and what we are seeing so far in terms of live attendance. Uh, it seems like we might just cross 250, be closer in that range. And also like uh, in terms of the number of IEEE members, non-IEEE, uh, IEEE and MTTS, it's been a record-breaking registration uh, for this event. So uh, yeah. yeah, just wanted to mention that. So with that, we'll go on to the details of today's talk, the title of which is Fundamentals of RF and Millimeter Wave Power Amplifier Design. Our speaker today is Dr. Hua Wang, who is a full professor and chair of electronics at the Department of Information Technology and Electrical Engineering of the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology Zurich, also known as ETH Zurich. He is the director of ETH Integrated Devices, Electronics and Systems, the Ideas Group. And prior to that, uh, a lot of you probably know of him. Uh, he was the associate professor with tenure at the School of Electrical, Engineer Electrical and Computer Engineering at uh, Georgia Tech. Uh, in the US. Uh, he's held various uh, uh, positions there and uh, 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 I, it take quite a long time to go through all this. I'll quickly skim through the main, main details here. So uh, he's interested in a wide range of uh, RF mixed signal and analog uh, domains uh, and hybrid systems for wireless communication, sensing and so on. He has authored and or co-authored over 200 peer reviewed journal and conference papers. Uh, he received uh, several awards, including the DARPA Director's Fellowship Award in 2020, DARPA Young Faculty Award in 2018, and so on. Uh, his research groups have won multiple academic awards and best paper awards uh, listed there. 
Uh, he's a TPC member for IEEE uh, ISSCC, RFIC, and other conferences. And uh, very important to our society, uh, he is going to be a distinguished microwave lecturer for MTTS for the term of 2022 to 2024. Uh, he is currently a distinguished lecturer for the Solid State Circuit Society for the term of uh, 2018 to 2019. And he serves as the chair of Atlanta's uh, CAS SSCS joint chapter uh, that won the outstanding chapter award in 2014. Uh, so a quick abstract for today's talk. Uh, this talk will present a focused overview of millimeter wave power amplifier design in silicon, including design fundamentals, advanced PA architectures, and state of the art design examples. Uh, this talk will start with an intro of PA performance metrics and their impacts on wireless systems. Next, it will present the design fundamentals of PA active devices and passive networks, as well as power combining strategies. Uh, and then also discuss advanced PA architectures, uh, hybrid PAs for high efficiency, linearity, and bandwidth. Antenna PA co designs will be covered uh, as well to uh, achieve on antenna power combining, load modulation, and reconfiguration. Uh, and finally, uh, after that and other things, will the talk will conclude with uh, uh, design examples, uh, state of the art uh, millimeter wave PA design examples. So uh, with that. Uh, I'm going to hand over the presentation to Dr. Wang. Okay. Let me share my screen. So can you see my uh, screen in the presentation mode? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, so uh, with that, let's get started. And uh, thank you for a kind introduction. And uh, hello, everyone. And this is Juan from ETH Zurich. It is my pleasure to give my first MTT Distinguished, distinguished Microwave Lecture Talk for the MTT Santa Clara Valley chapter. So my talk is on the fundamentals of RF and the military power and paper designs. So I would like to really thank and uh, Utkarsh and uh, Yudi Krishna for his kind invitation and as well as excellent organization of this, uh, of this uh, event. So I also want to thank everyone for attending my talk. All right, so here is a brief introduction of myself. I think and uh, the organizer already uh, gave an excellent introduction for me. So I think I want to skip it. So, uh, this is the outline of my talk, right? So in my talk, I will first talk about the background and, um, and in, as an introduction on the PA designs. So we'll explain why power amplifiers are so critical for wireless systems. So we'll also highlight several major technology needs for PAs. So with the surging of the interest in the 5G, 6G wireless, so my talk will mainly focus on millimeter wave power amplifier designs. Uh, but all the fundamentals are you know, applicable to both RF and the military PAs. And also for the general audience, my talk will focus mainly on the fundamentals, but we will also cover the, the state of the art as well. So next, and the, the PA basic will be introduced for the active devices and the passive network designs for a variety of designs and, uh, and the popular design examples. So after that, a section on the PA architecture will uh, introduce a, a kind of wide variety of military PA designs and examples. So following that, and we'll also present an emerging concept of this antenna PA co-design, so which can combine circuits with electromagnetic designs to really push the performance beyond conventional PA designs. So finally, a summary will conclude my talk. All right, so power amplifiers is, is the last active uh, circuit stage in our wireless transmitter to interface with antennas. So to generate sufficient signals for wireless transmission, power amplifiers are really needed in most wireless systems, so including the mobile devices, fixed point wireless, radar and imaging systems, and the satellite communications. So to really start, uh, let us uh, ask some uh, basic questions. So essentially, what is really a uh, power amplifier? Or actually, maybe to be more specific, when an amplifier should be called a PA, right? Is it necessary to generate 
what level of upper power to be considered as PAs, or, per, or perhaps and uh, for power amplifier designs and the data type of amplifiers, and when the designer should not follow conventional conjugate matchings. Or maybe they are the kind of amplifiers that will have a lot of nonlinearities, right? It can cause some damages. So hopefully through this talk and uh, in the, this will, the, um, I will help you answer these questions. A general PA schematic is shown here. So this is a two-stage PA with a driver and output uh, stage together with the input interstage and output matching networks. So in general, the PA can be separated into the active, the active, active circuit design and the passive network designs. So the active circuits deal with the device performance, the power amplifier classes and uh, waveform shapings and the device stabilities as well as the device reliabilities. Uh, the passive network will cover uh, impedance transformation, power combining, also waveform shaping, and the bandwidth filtering performance of the PAs. We will cover both topics and uh, later in this talk. So let us first define some very basic performance metrics of a PA and see how they will impact the performance of a wireless system. So the input power is defined as the PIN. The power at the PA device output, we define it as PPA, and the power delivered to the actual load, typically an antenna, uh, is defined as the P out or PL. The DC power is the DC power consumption total for both driver and the power stage. The power gain is the power to the load divided by the input power. So often the PA efficiency is described using drain efficiency, uh, which is the output power divided by the DC power consumption. Also, we often use the power added efficiency in short PAE to capture the effect of the input power. So as we can see that the PAE is very important for midway PAs or any PAs when the power gain is limited. Now let us see a simple example to highlight the importance of a PA design. So let us first assume the PA drain efficiency, let's say is 40% for the entire PA. Uh, this is a commonly achievable value for many RF and high power PAs or midway PAs. Let's say that the upper power delivered to load is one watt or 30 dBm. Then we know that the total DC power consumption based on the definition of drain efficiency and it should be 2.5 watt. And the one watt delivered to load as a result, 1.5 watt will simply be wasted as heat. This is certainly a challenge for thermal and management as, as we can see, and how we designed the, the packaging as well as how we and, uh, and define and extend the device operation time. So if the VDD of the PA is 2.5 volt, the total DC power current, uh, the total DC current then should be one amp. Then as a result, the supply and the ground metal traces and the VS should be very low, should have very low resistance to avoid DC IR drop due to this huge DC uh, current. And their design should, should also mitigate any reliability issues such as electron migration. So now let's look at the output uh, network loss. If the loss is one dB, that is around 80% of penalty, then the required <clears throat> PA intrinsic drain efficiency here should be as high as almost 50%. So with one watt uh, total power delivered to the load, the RF power loss just in the output matching network alone will be 250 milliwatt. This is essentially why the total, the low loss and the passive network design is really, really critical in PAs. Finally, let's consider the power, PA power gain. Assume the power gain is 20 dB, and that is a very common value also for the PAs to ensure sufficient gain, but also good stability. This essentially means that the input power needs to be uh, about 10 milliwatt or 10 dBm. At the millimeter wave, this is actually not trivial to generate this input power. Right? And that this will pose design challenges for the upconversion mixers. So it is useful to summarize the, the, the fundamental factors that are limiting the achievable PA efficiency in practice. In general, a PA's PAE is determined by, I would like to say, five factors. The first one is the device intrinsic efficiency. The device knee voltage is very important. And as it defines the minimum and the output voltage, the device output can swing down to. The device knee voltage and also the supply voltage 
together will limit the output RF voltage swing. The device large signal output impedance is also very critical because it will load the device output and shunt away some RF power in the large signal operation. The signal factor is the PA operation mode, but this is where we will use different PA classes and the harmonic shapings and the termination techniques and so on and so forth. So often this is here, this, this factor is the reason why PA design is often called waveform engineering. The third factor is the device power gain. It determines the required input power and will determine and govern the PAE. Again, when the active device and when the active device does not have sufficient power gain, for example, PA designs for high millimeter wave applications, this factor will becoming more and more significant, as we can see. The fourth factor is the PA output and the network loss. In the previous examples, we have seen that the, how the loss will impact the PA efficiency. Right? In addition, for differential PAs, right, the, the output network, the balancing of the, of the output network is also critical as well, so that we can have efficient power combining. Finally, the PA efficiency is also determined by the thermal effects, device aging, and the reliabilities and, and other factors. But due to the limited scope here, and we will not uh, cover all these aspects in this talk, but the, nevertheless, they are really critical for PA designs as well. So for PA designs, we need to specify the output power level, right? So we can really define our design goal. The PA output power is typically determined by the regulation and the link budget specified by the freeze transmission and the equation. So if we know the required received the power and then again, the distance and the carrier wavelengths, the carrier frequency, the required power and uh, therefore can be calculated as the PA output power. For the, R, for the RF frequency PAs, the typical power levels are often between somewhere 20 to 26 dBm, really depending on the standards. So with some exceptions such as low power Bluetooth and uh, low energy applications. So, but the, for the millimeter PAs, the required PA output power actually has a direct relationship with array size since we often will use phase arrays or MIMO arrays. And um, as well as the total and the ERP, which stands for the equivalent isotropically rated power. So given an ERP, a small array will require a larger and PA output power because we have less number of elements. On the other hand, for a larger array, and uh, we can reduce the element level PA uh, uh, output power requirement, but it will need a large panel size, a sharper beam, and uh, more system overhead and the complicated beam forming and the tracking and the algorithms. So in this table, the element level PA upper power values for different applications are actually shown here. And we can see that they have direct relationship with the required ERP and their array size. So next, I would like to highlight several technology needs or challenges for high performance PAs. It is quite useful to see the state of the art and the power generation capabilities by using solid state electronics. So my group develops a PA survey on the PAs and in different technologies and reported since 2000. So the output power of the reported PAs and in different technologies are plotted here versus the carrier frequency. At the lower frequency, the upper power is typically limited by the application and the regulations. And when the frequency goes higher, we start to see an interesting and a monotonic decrease of upper power and due to the device limitations. And also interestingly, this trend roughly follows this minus 20 dB per decay, and that matches well with the device Johnson limit. This plot is useful for uh, on the system level designs to estimate achievable PA upper power for a given technology at a given frequency. So in summary, it is indeed challenging to achieve high upper power for high frequency applications. Right. That's the first challenge. The signal challenge is the output power versus the efficiency. The silicon devices we know have very limited output power capabilities and limited voltage swing. So for a larger output power, one will need to increase the output uh, RF current as well as reduce the load resistance. This means we need a larger device or we need to put more devices in parallel. This also requires a larger impedance transformation and the ratio by the PA output matching network. 
So both of these requirements will actually introduce more loss and the degraded overall efficiency. The figure on the right summarizes the peak PA and PAE versus the maximum upper power for reported 20 to 50 dB you know, gigahertz and the PAs in silicon. At the low power level, the PA, PAE is around a constant value of around 45%. Some of the designs can be slightly higher to 50% for the 20 to 50 gigahertz PAs, which is really defined and limited by the silicon device and the intrinsic efficiency and the passive loss of the network. I call this region as a device limited regime. However, when we move to a higher upper power, for example, 23 dBm and above in this case, we'll see a very sharp and rapid degradation of the efficiency versus the upper power. This is because the single silicon devices can no longer deliver such a high upper power. So more devices and will be needed and more complex passive combiners will be needed and the which together will introduce more power loss and a degraded efficiency. So I call this region as the combiner and the network limited regime. So therefore, we can see that it is challenging to achieve PAs with high upper power, high efficiency, and a compact area uh, all at the same time. The next challenge is the trade-off of PA spectrum efficiency, linearity, and energy efficiency. So spectrally efficient, and the wideband modulations, such as high order qualms and the OFDM signals are widely used to boost the throughput and the in wireless communication applications. And even for radar and sensing, the complete waveforms such as OFDM uh, start to be used to advance the, the sensing capabilities as we can see. So these complicated waveforms as we know, typically will require a uh, higher PA linearity so that they, we can resolve these constellations. So therefore, there is really the need for PA to support both high linearity and also high data rate at the same time, which is also a challenge. But at the same time, for the PA designs, we know that the linearity and efficiency, and they always go hand in hand. These complex, all these complex modulations will often have large peak to average power ratio, PAPR. The figure on the left, shows the envelope signal of a one gigasymbol per second, 64 qualms and the modulation signal. The probability density function and the, of the envelope is shown on the right versus the power and the backup levels. As we can see that the majority of the power is actually located around this 6.5 dB of backup average and close to its PAPR. Uh, however, most of the PAs actually achieve their high, highest efficiency at the maximum of the power. So they are designed to behave like that. So a theoretical class BPA and the backup efficiency versus the, current, the up backup power level curve uh, is actually also plotted here. As we can see that at a 6 dB power backup and uh, the, the efficiency of the PA is only half of its peak value. So we can define the average PA efficiency therefore as the integration of the PA backup efficiency weighted by the envelope probability density function. Uh, for the particular modulation. Uh, this is at the actual efficiency when amplifying the, the modulated signal for the PA, which is often more important than the PA CW peak efficiency, especially for wireless communication applications. So therefore we can see that there is this critical need to realize high PA backup efficiency together with high linearity. So finally, the spectrum is crowded, we know, at the gigahertz frequency. And for the millimeter frequency and often and, uh, and the multiple non-contiguous bands are being assigned. So for example, for the millimeter 5G applications and uh, uh, different bands are being used in different countries and regions to really support this multi-band and multi-mode and the international low limit capabilities, the wide band or frequency reconfigurable PAs are often needed. But on the other hand, we know that broadband operations often will have trade-offs with upper power and efficiency, which is particularly true for PAs. So that actually posed um, also as a challenge. So to summarize and everything together, we can use a kind of PA design and a hexagon to highlight all the challenges uh, and the trade-offs among the, these performance metrics. So this level of complexity, I would like to say, really makes the PA designs both challenging and full of innovation of opportunities. We can actually delve deeper into the state-of-the-art PA performance based on our PA survey. 
Right. You can download the, the most updated version six and the peer survey and using this link is uh, public available online. So uh, we can use the millimeter PAs of between uh, 20 to 50 gigahertz to better visualize the trade-off, especially between the PA output power and the PAE. Right? The X axis is the output power and the Y axis is the, the peak PAE. So as I mentioned, for the silicon PA designs, we can see that the medium on the or low power level the best achievable PAE around this frequency is actually around 45% for both CMOS and CD PAs in this and the device limited regime. To improve the efficiency here, we really need to improve the devices themselves, or we should look at how best we can shape the large signal waveforms and how best we can use the device in the large signal operations. And for example, a different type of harmonic terminations. On the other hand, once we move to the higher upper power levels, and the PAE drops, as we have seen, sharply in this combiner or network limited regime. So the, the inflection point and for silicon based PAs, interestingly, is around 22, 22 to 23 dBm. So again, this is where we should explore new circuit innovations and for better power combinings and to close and to, to so that we can really close the, the efficiency gap between these high uh, power PAs versus the, the device limited the, the, the PAE values. So if we may record the PA of power versus the array size and the four millimeter PAs, we can see that in many applications, including the handset and some base stations, and, and the, 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 they have already set the millimeter PA power requirement close or even lower than this value of 23 dBm. So I'm not sure whether this was actually set intentionally or coincidentally, but nevertheless, this upper power level suggests that the silicon will be a capable technology platform for these millimeter PA applications. So to deliver such low to medium power level with a very competitive efficiency. At the same time, if we, look, we, may, if we may look at the three, five PAs at this frequency range, the gas PAs typically can generate more than five to 10 dB upper power than the silicon PAs. While the gallium nitride PAs can generate more than let's say 15 to 20 dB of upper power and really reach the power level of over 45 dBm around this frequency. So now, if, again, if we look at this uh, PA upper power versus array and the size summary, we can see that these three, five technologies are really and, uh, needed for high power and base station applications. So there are a lot of exciting R&D and uh, activities, especially on millimeter GAN PAs recently. So they will play a big role and in 5G and potentially beyond 5G applications, I believe. Due to the limited focus of this talk, and uh, we will actually not be able to cover and, uh, and, uh, these three, five and uh, PAs here in this talk. But for those who are interested, I encourage you to look at the recent literature, literatures and uh, learn the new designs and new advances. So we have just a look at the, and the continuous wave and the, the performance summary for the reported PAs. Uh, regarding the, the PAE versus the upper power and the trade-off. But as we mentioned that and the, if we intend to use the PAs for typically for wireless communication applications, the modulation performance is even more important. So this plot actually summarizes the, the, the reported 20 to 50 gigahertz and the CMOS CD PAs with 64 quantum modulation test. So we may look at the, the designs with a uh, high speed modulation. And uh, here we mainly look at designs uh, with high speed modulation at least with 100 mega symbol per second. So the X axis here is now is the average upper power while the Y axis is the average efficiency. So both doing the modulations. So recently the best report the PAE and average PAE is not above 25% with an average upper power around 15 to 16 dBm. So on the PA research, I would like to say it will be interesting to, to see if we can push this value to really to, to call this uh, to this so-called 20 to 20 performance. Essentially 20 dBm average upper power with 20% 20, 20 of average efficiency. That will be interesting to see. <clears throat> Going back and a look at this um, PA, uh, again, upper power versus an uh, array size chart. So we can see that the recent PA technologies can address the 50, address the 20% of required average PAE efficiency requirement already. So on the other hand, if we compare the modulated performance versus the CW performance of millimeter PAs in this frequency, 
clearly there, uh, there are huge differences in terms of energy efficiency and also average of power. To improve the average efficiency and energy efficiency, we really need to investigate new PE architectures and the linearization techniques so that we can minimize the unnecessary power backoffs. This is actually where the architectures such as Doherty PAs and the outfacing PAs will really shine. So, but to boost the average of the power, it is very important to look at the new linearization techniques and also new power combining techniques, <clears throat> as well as PA reconfiguration, and to ensure its linearity with uh, complete power combining and, uh, and even over PBT and the variations. So therefore, again, in my opinion, there is plenty of space for research innovations on power amplifiers, as we can see. Um, if we want to understand the cons constraints on PAs for high millimeter applications, right? For so-called the 60 or the beyond 5G or 60 applications, I believe we really need to put them in the context of arrays because for those applications, we'll just pretty much use arrays almost at, at all the applications. So this is well known. It is well known that if we have a perfect beam forming with an array of n elements, so the total radiator power and uh, the will be increased by 10 log n, right? While the total ERP will, will be enhanced by 20 log n with another 10 log n as the array and the gain. On the receiver side, the receiver array and SNR and also the noise figure will be enhanced by 10 log n as well. So therefore, if we use both TX and RX arrays to form a wireless link, the link budget will increase by 30 log n. That's really the benefit. But of course, at the same time, we need to be aware of the price we are paying. The total power consumption now increases by a factor of n, right? This res the, the resulting thermal effects will directly impact how we choose the packaging technologies and the cooling solutions. The array panel size and also increases by a factor of n, right? which may be limited by the act actual applications. For example, some of the mobile applications, we just cannot afford to have a large boom factor and uh, for the entire an uh, antenna panel. At the same time, array the main lobe beam width and will reduce by a factor of n. This may, be, uh, this may be fine for some static applications, but it will substantially increase the TXRX beam alignment challenges in mobile applications. And uh, uh, in particular, those applications where the, the, the environment, uh, environments are dynamic and often unknown. So, well, we may wonder uh, what will happen when we are building arrays for uh, sub terahertz and 60 applications. So in particular, if we keep the same array panel size, what is the link budget if we scale the array to higher and higher frequency? So we know the path loss and the based on free transmission formula is inversely proportional to the frequency. So if we keep the array panel size the same, we may assume that the, 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 if the, the, the element size will, will scale with the wavelength and then it, can, it will be inversely proportional to the frequency. So in this case, the total element number for the same array panel size of the TX and RRX array will increase proportionally to the frequency. Right? Then we can find out the total link budget we can calculate uh, considering and, uh, and, uh, both and, uh, these factors Will be, uh, will be increasing to the power of four of the carry frequency. This, this result actually interesting is suggesting that uh, the, the higher the frequency we go, the better the wireless link will have. So this is also the result that is often being quoted in many uh, system level papers and invited talks. But the question that it is really true, it really depends on many important assumptions here, right? First of all, it assumes that the, the trend, the TX element of power should be constant versus the frequency. The TXR and the, the element efficiency should also be constant versus the frequency. And the receiver element noise figure should be constant over frequency. And the array element size should indeed be an, an scale, scaled inversely proportional to the frequency. However, we know that the TX of power decreases sharply with frequency as we just seen on a PA survey. The, P and the transmitter efficiency and also RF noise figure both will degrade rapidly over frequency as well. Well, the last thing we want to check that what about the assumption on this array element size? So my research group also did another survey on, the, on this on the particular topic. 
the x axis here is the carry frequency, while the y axis here is the, and the dimension of a full Tx and Rx array element. Right? So basically, co capture the element and uh, including both Tx and Rx in the same element. So we can look at the, we look at the papers and the published in the recent 10 to 15 years that have reported manipulative arrays using an integrated circuits. They are placed as the red, red dots on these figures, okay? Each red dot representing the, the data from one paper. So at the same time, we can assume that the lemma of two in the air is the desired array elements so that we can avoid any grading lobes when we are putting together an array. So we can draw it and this uh, over the carry frequency shown here as the blue curve. Okay, we can see that for the lower millimeter frequency, the reported array element size, they are actually below this blue curve. And this is great. This means that they can be implemented in a 2D scalable array, not a problem. And in our assumption, we expect the element size to decrease with the frequency. And we can see that this is probably true up to from lower frequency up to 50 gigahertz. But then the array element size actually start to increase versus the frequency. The crossing point as of today is around 70 to 100 gigahertz, meaning that beyond this frequency, we even cannot fit a full transceiver element in the, in the, in, in, in the, in the array lattice. So why that? So of course, there are several reasons. And the, one of them is really because the device do not have sufficient power gain anymore beyond 100 gigahertz. So often we need to cascade many stages. This is particularly true for power and play bars, right? In addition, many and compact the non passive uh, and components have limited self resonant frequency and for the higher and higher frequency. So they need to be replaced by distributed passives, which are actually larger. As we can see that in the higher frequency, you will see more power amplifiers are being built by using transmission lines and which actually will cause more area. So uh, I believe that the, the technology innovation and the more research eventually will help, help us push this crossing point to a higher and higher frequency. But anyway, it is clear that uh, as of today, and I believe, and in the future, that the reported transceiver elements size are actually will be constant or even increasing for at higher frequency because of these limitations. Right. <clears throat> so a few um, a few um, the points for the individual building blocks at higher frequency are also being plotted here, which again shows that the size are really large compared to the wavelengths at the minimum frequency. So by the way, uh, maybe as a side topic. And uh, this plot may also give us some insights on the weather and how the arrays should be built and uh, with the with antennas. Essentially, shall we place on-chip antennas or shall we use and, uh, and unpackaged antennas? So interestingly, for lower than 70 to 100 gigahertz, the on-chip antennas may be uh, considered to be too large and not economical for implementations on chip. But above 100 gigahertz, we can see that and we even don't have a lot of space and in the array lattice to fit all the electronics, let alone any on-chip antennas, unless we can come up with very compact on-chip antennas. So therefore, in most and actually 2D scalable and commercially viable arrays, it probably makes sense to place antennas on package as of today. So I, therefore, I believe that the, the package research and the heterogeneous integration are really essential for future and the 6G and the array and uh, systems. So finally, I also want to talk about the power density since we, have, we were considering the size. Let's talk about power density. So a common way to describe the, the power density and uh, is, is essentially using this aspect for the device power and the capabilities, which is defined as the watt per millimeter. So P set divided by device peripheral size. Uh, this is a function of the device parameters such as the maximum drain and the voltage during current density and the frequency and so on and so forth. This metric is often being used in the 3.5 compound semiconductor and the PA community. And it is a very, um, is, it is a very good device centric metric that can be used to compare different device technologies and their intrinsic power generation capabilities. But on the other hand, we can actually define another power density and metric as the saturated upper power divided by the, 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 the PA core area. So essentially watt per millimeter square. It is not only a function of the device and watt per millimeter metric, but also it depends on the backend quality, <clears throat> the layout compactness, and also the PA topologies. So therefore, 
the millimeter squared density is actually more a circuit centric metric instead of a device centric metric. So which can, this can be used to really compare different circuits and plan the system level architectures for the transmitters and also an entire array. Since we are, limit, we are, limit, we are being really limited on the, on the size for higher, higher frequency applications. So, well, there are also other useful applications of this watt per millimeter square metric, right? Of course, for example, it tells us uh, the, 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 the area efficiency of different technologies when generating a certain RF, RF upper power, of course. And uh, conversely, and given the chip area, and we can actually estimate the achievable PA upper power. This is very useful for array-based planning. Once we know the array frequency, we kind of know the array letter size based on level two in the air of the size. Then we can assign certain percentage of the area of the element uh, of the array element size for the PAs. Then we can based on the using the, the watt per millimeter square metric based on the, the, the literature survey, we can kind of estimate what is the set of upper power we can generate per PA. And then now for a given array ERP, we kind of can estimate what will be the array element to meet the ERP requirement. Then we will know what's the panel size we, we have to go for and to, to meet that target. Uh, so in addition, if we actually note the chip cost as, as a dollar per minute square, then we can use this watt per minute square metric to calculate the, the cost to generate the target of power as the watt per dollar, for example. That's another application of this metric. So let's see what 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 we, what is the power density and as a watt per meter square uh, have been reported for integrated PAs above, for example, ninety gigahertz. If we care about these higher higher frequency applications, so this plot summarizes reported PAs in CMOS, CGE, galenitride, and also indium phosphate from two thousand to, uh, to present. So. Um, the, by the way, this power density data is also available and, uh, and as a new feature in our in the PA survey version six, you can download again online. We can see that regardless of the technology right, and the watt per minute square and the, and the metric will decrease over the frequency. So these two dashed lines are essentially the kind of the AMDO curves for the Indian phosphate technology and also CMOS technologies. Uh, by the way, although it's not being shown here, the watt per millimeter in, millimeter in the square and the metric also decreases with PSAT due to the overhead and the loss of complex power combiners. And this, is, this makes sense, right? And also for the Indian phosphate PAs, we can see that it has the highest watt per millimeter square density at this high frequency above 90 gigahertz applications. This makes sense. And, um, and, and, uh, uh, and this is really due to the high gain of these Indian phosphate devices. So in addition, some of the GAN PAs achieve the highest P set and the watt power and the watt level of, of the power, which also makes sense. We know that. But however, if we look at the watt per uh, the power density as a watt per minute square for the GAN and the, and the devices versus silicon devices, we actually see and it's actually very interesting to see that some of the CMOS designs actually achieve similar or even better watt per minute square density than the GAN PAs. So this is true even after removing some of the, the outlier points of silicon designs, and we can still see this interesting trend. So to me, this is actually quite counterintuitive, right? Because since the GAN PAs we all know typically will have about 15 to 20 times better watt per millimeter capabilities and CMOS devices at this frequency. However, apparently this advantage at the device level is not really showing up in the watt per, in the watt per millimeter square metric at a circuit level at all. So, but if we look closely on this and, and the difference, we can see that the CMOS technology typically will support much uh, more compact layout for both active devices and the passive uh, components. For example, the device uh, layout uh, has less overhead, so we can place two or multiple devices very close to each other uh, compared to the GAN devices. So moreover, the CMOS technologies will typically support more versatile backend options, more backend layers. This will allow us to implement compact and high coupling passive networks and passive components. And uh, this again shows that the unique capabilities of silicon technologies and for these very high frequency millimeter wave and applications. But, but at the same time, I know that there have been uh, new research efforts and such as the US and the DARPA, the new ELGA program, 
and, uh, and focusing on in how to improve the watt per minute square power density performance of 3-5 compounds and technologies, especially at this sub millimeter frequency, for example, 230 gigahertz and 240 gigahertz. So we'll see a very interesting research coming up in the next several years. So, but in summary, the existing integrated in the, in the TA and TRX array elements actually do not scale with the frequency if we are talking about these very high frequency applications. So we actually see a crossing point at around 70 to 100 gigahertz, right? So uh, as a result, the high millimeter PAs for these beyond 5G and 6G applications, we, and we need to focus on all the more traditional PA metrics, but at the same time, they need to be very compact. They need to be energy efficient and also area efficient at the same time. So I'm sure that this will actually stimulate and the new innovations on the devices and the circuits and system and packaging levels and so on and so forth in the future. So I think with that, I want to take a, and a short break. So to see if um, there are any questions. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so folks, uh, please go ahead and use the reaction button. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand and I'll unmute you. So go ahead. Uh, Guang Xiang Li, uh, please unmute yourself. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you, thank you, Professor, for the talk uh, so far. So uh, I have one question you mentioned about uh, for the next PA, people could push to even higher frequency than the current standard 5G or even beyond. So uh, like you mentioned 200 something, you know, more than 200 G. So my question is uh, for the current uh, wireless um, technology, like uh, I think uh, if you push to that much high frequency, uh, the pulse loss will be very dramatically. Uh, so how, you know, I mean, just uh, curious how the future wise technology can follow up with the device innovation or the co, co go together with, you know, hand by hand to, uh, to de deliver the, um, the, the future customer, customer need. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's, that's an excellent question, right? So I think that the question is touched bases on two aspects. One is what is the application? The second thing that uh, do we have devices that support this high frequency, right? I would like to say that, uh, you know, regarding applications, it is still, um, and, uh, and, uh, it is still in, the, in, the, in the forming phase, right? It's not very clear, but certainly people are talking about a variety of applications such as uh, uh, and the indoor or the short range and the, and, the, and the wireless communication with very high data rates. For example, something called the information shower, and that is put in, that is one possible user user case. Another application is the near range and the very fine resolution and the, the sensing and the imaging. That's certainly another possible application. Regarding the devices, and the, that's a very good, that's an excellent and uh, question. As we can see that the PA designs and actually in general, all the front-end electronic designs really depends on the, and for these high frequency application, really depends on the capability of devices, essentially FTF medical devices, right? So I think there have been research ongoing now to really push um, the, the device and the frequency, uh, the device operating frequency to, to a higher frequency so that we can support and, uh, these applications. Thank you, Professor. Oh, ne uh, yep. Next question, uh, Nazif Farid, please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, Professor. Thank you for the talk. Um, my question is, uh, is wire bonding still a thing now for millimeter wave PAs or is flip chip the future? I'm asking because I'm not sure what the cost gap is between flip chip and, and wire bonding. Thank you. Uh uh, that's a good question. So I think and I will mainly uh, comment from a performance perspective, right? I think we have been seeing on the wire bonding based the PAs and uh, up to 20 gigahertz or even higher frequency. And that this seem to be, and the, from performance perspective, still a viable option. Going to a higher and a higher frequency and that we, we actually see more and more common use of uh, fleet chip packaging, right? And this, that which also allows us to have more and dense wiring and with less couplings. Yeah, I have seen that the, in the research groups, they have demonstrated the, and the fleet chip bonding and the based packaging to uh, 150 gigahertz or even higher frequency, as long as we can minimize the, 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 
the fleet uh, packaging the, the bump, yeah, and all uh, take that the parasitics into consideration in the design is possible. Thank you, Professor. Next question, yep. uh, Rafael Perez Martinez, please unmute yourself. Uh, hello, Dr. Wang. I have a question hello. about uh, three five devices in particular. Uh, can you can you talk more about uh, linearity performance between silicon based PAs and then three five such as gallium arsenide and gallium nitride PAs? I know that GAN has like this this thing called soft compression and that affects linearity to some extent. Can you comment more on that and if it's possible to actually push the linearity performance even more, especially during modulation? No, oh, that's a that's a great question. So. I think and uh, uh, that's that's a great question. So um, indeed, and the the, the compound semiconductors in particular, I would like to say, can have this uh, soft compression and uh, and the issues, right? In the sense that you will see and the sharp drop of AM to AM and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, even well before the, the P set. So I think and uh, on that there are different circuit techniques that can uh, hopefully and uh, and uh, compensate for that. Um, and then uh, at the same time, I'm sure you probably are aware that uh, there, uh, there are new device engineering that can kind of improve this aspect. But I also at the same time, and there have been research on the digital sign and the signal and the processing or digital pre-distortion to correct that. But all of these plus and the, and the auxiliary techniques will really depends on the modulation rate. Yeah. Okay. Uh Next question is from Rui Jia Liu. Uh, please unmute yourself. Hello, Professor Wang. Hello. Um, uh, I have one question. Um, this question confused me for a very long time. That is, uh, uh, for, uh, for the 3-5 compound device, for example, the gallium nitride, it, it is very common that um, at a low frequency, its uh, drain voltage can be um, 28 voltage or even higher, but it is very difficult for some millimeter wave uh, applications. For example, the 0 0.55 process, the drain voltage is typically uh, 20 voltage. Uh, can, can, can you give me some, some reason? Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm uh, I'm not sure if I really understand your question. Can you kind of rephrase your question? So, and we know that the indeed, yeah, GAN devices typically they will have higher supply voltages, right? There are different type of GAN devices, and uh, and uh, and uh, some of them they they have because of the intrinsic and the kind of uh, 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 Johnson limit trade off, and you can design redesign the devices so that it has a lower and the voltage, but uh, can give you a higher frequency. And uh, is that something you are uh, referring to or can you please rephrase your question? Oh, okay. My question is, uh, it seems that uh, some gallium nitride process at the millimeter wave frequency is hard to have a very high um, drain supply voltage. For example, uh, its voltage is limited to about 20 voltage volt. Uh, and uh, uh, for some sub six gigahertz applications, for example, the zero two point five uh, micron process, its typical drain supply voltage can even high to twenty eight or 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 even higher. Uh. Okay, sure. I, I would like to say maybe the simplest answer is that this really follows the the the, the classic and, uh, and to the first order and maybe even to the zeroth order the Johnson limit, right? You can using the same material you can re-engineer the device and to have the trade off between the by sizing to have the trade off between the breakdown voltage versus the operating frequency. If you want the device to operate a higher frequency, you have to have higher FDF max. As a result, the, the your your breakdown voltage need to decrease. Yep, thank you, Professor. Uh, Renuka, go ahead, ask your question. Hello, Dr. Wong, the, that's a very interesting talk. I have a quick question. In one of your previous slides, uh, you mentioned that the output uh, matching network loss is close to 250 millivolts. Uh, watts. 
so quick question so is uh, is the matching network is also built on the same substrate like silicon or uh, silicon or germanium substrate or is it will be on a different one if so if there is any research going on on how to minimize this losses oh absolutely this is an excellent excellent question so i think you are referring to this particular slide right we are talking about let's say i assume that 1 db loss of the matching network which will give you like 80% of the and the, the power will actually go to the load, 20% of penalty. And here, I'm just giving a generic number of 1 dB loss, right? In reality, it depends on applications, right? For these um, uh, and uh, uh, RFPAs, uh, uh, you, you can choose to design the upper mesh network on chip. You can also choose to design the upper mesh network on, uh, off chip on the package, on the board. And the, both of them, they are viable, very viable. Even for some of the military applications, and, the, and the, there have been research ongoing, and uh, for uh, the, the, the uh, designing the, the to uh, to uh, to achieve this passive passive mesh network on the package or through the, the and the you know three D integration, hydrogen integration. This is also possible. Even on the same substrate, there are different ways to do it too. Right, and uh, so let's say if we are using the SOI substrate with high resistivity, typically that give you uh, a little bit less loss in the passive network, and uh, that will help you reduce the the, the 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 power penalty here as well. Yeah. Thank you, Professor. Uh, uh, Timothy Lee, uh, you can unmute yourself. Hi, uh, Wow, this is Tim Lee. Uh, good to see you. Hello, Tim. Uh, my question to you is, given that the gain of the devices um, keeps going down versus frequency, uh, you know, above 100 gigahertz to 200, 300 gigahertz, so what is the maximum um, op DC operating mode do you think it's usable? I mean, obviously you can do class A, class B, but some of your hybrid order mode eventually for switching mode, are they still useful or you really cannot use those modes? Okay, uh, Tim, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So, and typically rule of thumb, and we, we as a PA designer, we often use, uh, really depends on how much we are willing to sacrifice the efficiency and also the gain, right? So let's say we want to have reasonable gain, still reasonable efficiency. And, uh, and typically we want in the for class A operation, we want to make sure that the, our operation, uh, it will be no more than typically one third of your F max. Right, so whatever device F max, we divide by three, and that will be uh, the, the class A of uh, frequency of operation, right? So therefore, if we are talking about uh, and, uh, and the device with F max of 450 gigahertz, we, the, we probably want to operate around 100, maximum 150 gigahertz. And sometimes different techniques will help us to improve it. But as you mentioned, when we go to those more switching and the, the, the topologies, <coughs> And uh, we we just have we just have to throw away the gain even further. Then then that may all, may not be viable anymore. So I think one third of the F max is a good guideline to start with. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Henry Hu, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, hello, Professor Wang. Hello. Thank you for giving us the talk and. Uh, um, I'm not sure if you are still in Europe. If you are, then we really appreciate you working in your late, let's say midnight, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, I have two questions. The first question is, can you make a general comment on this? I think there's two technologies, gallium nitride on silicon carbide and then gallium nitride on silicon. Can you make a general comment to see which, um, technology will succeed in the future in commercialized, in let's say, in wireless infrastructure for commercialization. And then the, the second question I have is, uh, there was some issues on, let's say, hysteresis issues on the compound semiconductors when applying the DPD. Um, can you make a comment and uh, how to address that, uh, if, if it can be addressed? Thank you. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, Henry, good question. So I have to say that I'm not an expert in um, the, the common semiconductor PAs and uh, compared to our experience in the silicon-based PAs. So I think, and uh, I'm afraid that, that I don't want to give you, and uh, that I don't want to give you misleading answers. 
So for these, and the, 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 your questions are very specific for carbon, carbon semiconductor PAs. Maybe we, you and I, we can discuss offline. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, what about the hysteresis? Because uh, for example, on the LDMOS, we do not see this when, imp when applying the uh, DPDs, but on some of the sem compound semiconductor, we, we see that. Uh, can you comment on that? Yeah, I think this is something to do with, I believe this is something to do with the, uh, the, uh, the device level memory effects and also thermal effects, right? So uh, I think in the, uh, uh, um, this is more towards the, 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 the DPD techniques, yeah. Okay, uh, Fabio Bunny, uh, unmute yourself. Uh, Professor Wang, I wanted to ask um, a little bit about um, the connection between heat and power density. Now, we know, or as far as I'm aware, that uh, the problem, the main problem related to heat and power losses is not uh, the efficiency in itself, but the fact that uh, this heat, this generated heat, distorts the functioning of the device. Uh, mm -hmm. if, it is, if it is an active device or it generates noise, if it is a passive device resistant, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of power density, so if we shrink the layout more and more and more, uh, heat, of course, might be able to spread more easily. Uh, is that a concern in a power amplifier design? Thanks. Uh, uh, that's a good question. And uh, certainly that's a concern. Right, and when we start to increase the, the power, uh, when we are to start to in, uh, engineer our devices as well as, as well as the circuits to include the bar per millimeter, per millimeter square and the metric, we'll actually see that uh, the, we will start to hit the wall of the thermal dissipations. So I think that is essentially something, you know, we need to know the motivation why we want to increase the watt per millimeter square because we want to, especially for higher frequency application, we want to fit into the array. So that size, which is a hard limit. So as a result, it will create a problem of heat dissipation. And then therefore we need to come up with new actually packaging or cooling techniques that we can actually carry the heat away. So this is just something that a resulting and the task we have to and, uh, you know, and uh, explore. That's a good question. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Chuan Shi, uh, please unmute yourself. Uh, hi, uh, Dr. Wang, uh, this is Chuan. Uh, so actually I, I have a question regarding the uh, PA with range uh, from 70 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz. So with, range, with, with this range of frequency, uh, so if we want to design a PA with directly power combining with phase arrays, uh, so, uh, how will we, for example, if we choose a different classes of the PA, we need to engineer different uh, impedance for the harmonic frequency. So in, in this range of the frequency, when we're directly using the antennas, so do we need like the uh, actual element for the power combining uh, output network for the PA to engineer the harmonics? And if we do, um, so I'm just want to make sure, so is this a kind of a network that's still based on transmission line based network or we need to use some kind of waveguide structure to engineer like that. Okay, yeah, sure. So I think that if I understand your question correctly, uh, I think it um, for this uh, frequency of PA designs, it depends on applications, right? So uh, if we have, uh, let's assume that we have large size of array and uh, then we don't have to do, uh, and, uh, and then we can actually design each PA elements with a relatively moderate upper power. And uh, at this frequency, I have seen designs, especially in silicon, and uh, around maybe 20 dBm, or uh, you know, that is, has been reported. And uh, there are designs which achieve even higher upper power. So at this power level, okay, uh, it is certainly possible to do power combining and, uh, and, uh, and the, to do some kind of harmonic waveform shaping. Probably not a lot of harmonics, and, uh, but and you can still have some kind of harmonics wave, waveform shaping, typically at least like second order harmonics. So um, regarding your question, whether we should use the transformers or transmission lines or lumped elements, uh, I have seen both, honestly. I have seen and the both and, the, and, the, and the, I think the, uh, 
uh, transformers and the basic designs, they are pretty popular even at this frequency. Uh, they start to fall short at higher frequencies. But at this frequency, 70 to 100 gigahertz, you, you, we have seen transformer designs. And we have also seen compact using coupler designs, which actually my group, we have, we have designed several and, uh, examples too. Um, and the pure transmission line designs, and uh, uh, for, the, for example, the micro strip lines, they are being used at this frequency as well, especially in the earlier kind of uh, the exploration for high frequency millimeter PAs. Uh, and because they are, uh, they lend themselves to very easy modeling. Uh, they are also particularly useful for the process where you don't have a lot of metal layers. Uh, that's very useful too. So, but I think from a design, being divine, you know, compact design perspective and the steel lumped elements and the transformers or some kind of compact couplers will still be uh, uh, and uh, probably a more preferred choice. Thank you. Uh, Ibrahim Chamas, please unmute yourself. Yeah, hi. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, uh, thanks for the talk, Ray. Uh, uh, so my question is for this equation for the power added efficiency. Um, I, I'd like to see also the impact of the bandwidth mode, right? Because you can operate at five gigahertz and use 20 megahertz bandwidth mode, or you can operate at one gigahertz and use 200 megahertz bandwidth mode. And that makes the design more challenging. So, you know, specifically when you do a DPD uh, and you need to operate a 3x the bandwidth or sometimes 4x the bandwidth uh, mm -hmm. for the at least the pre PA uh, matching networks and all of this. So, what are the solutions to operate at large bandwidth modes, not just high frequencies? Sorry, and uh, and uh, and uh, I think and uh, can you rephrase your question? I guess you are talking about the bandwidth versus the efficiency. Yeah, the bandwidth, right? Because, for example, as I mentioned, like when you want to do DPD, you want to operate at three x the bandwidth, so even four x the bandwidth. So the fractional bandwidth becomes sometimes the challenging design metric, uh, not just the operating frequency. And uh, you know, if you want a wide bandwidth, then you want low Q, and that degrades the efficiency. Is that is that trade-off has been broken in some design, some ideas that you are aware of? Sure, sure. Uh, that's, and that's an ex excellent question, right? So uh, I think, let, let, let's say we are talking about, let's, let's just for, let's just take the, and, uh, and, uh, an example PA with 30 gigahertz of uh, uh, carrier frequency, right? So uh, it really, I think it really depends on applications. If we are talking about 100, 200 megahertz of modulation bandwidth, or even three times of that, uh, that is still much lower than, you know, 10% of the carry frequency bandwidth. For a PA with 10% of bandwidth, typically we don't, you know, in most applications, and uh, we don't have to uh, make extra efforts to broaden the bandwidth. You will get that bandwidth more or less and, uh, and uh, directly if you do the design you know, right, uh, using relatively advanced process and, uh, and, uh, and uh, reasonable practice. So your question really comes into, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and I think the picture, when we are talking about the modulation frequency of multi gigahertz of a bandwidth, I think that is possible. Uh, if we you want to do let's say multi tone and uh, and the PAs and the massive I don't know uh, carry aggregations and in that case that that will indeed face a lot of challenges right the DPD as you mentioned and uh, and uh, and actually will have even all, that will also have challenges about how we define the, the how we design the bias network that will not interfere with the and the, with the uh, 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 with basically signal path, right? And if we want to have active load, active load modulation or active uh, the, the biasing network, adaptive biasing network, they need, their response need to be fast enough. But typically we are talking about 100 megahertz and uh, also applications. And uh, from a PA pers design perspective, from load the Q perspective and the four millimeter PAs, this is typically not a concern. Uh, even for even up to several hundred uh, several hundreds of megahertz, this is okay. Uh, thank you, Professor. The questions are still there. Uh, I, I suggest we proceed uh, with the rest of the talk, and uh, we can come back to the Q and A later. Please hold on to your questions, uh, and uh, we can ask them at the next Q and A slot. Thank you. Yeah.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for the, for the questions. I guess considering the time, and I need to kind of speed up with my presentation. So I think that the next uh, the section, I want to look at the PA design fundamentals on both active devices and passive network designs. So we start from the active devices, right? Let me first introduce the concept of local controls. As I mentioned, I want to cover more fundamentals. It is introduced to show that the PA behavior when and the PA is seeing a complex load, right? Not the simple ideal and the resistant, uh, let's say ideal optimal load based on load line. And what if the load is mismatched, right? Let's look at the behavior. So let's take this class APA as, a, as, as an example. So let's assume that the real part of the mismatched the complex load and uh, and uh, and the uh, and the, the ZL and then basically is equals RL. The real part is RL, which is also smaller than R optimal. So therefore, in this case, the device will operate in the current limit regime without essentially pumping out the full current, but without reaching its maximum upper voltage. The upper power in this case can be calculated as one over two R optimal times and times I IMX kind of square, and uh, and uh, which is actually and uh, k times smaller than the uh, maximum and upper power. The k equals RL divided by R optimum, which is smaller than one. And here we can define the k as the power degradation factor. So for this particular and the, and the, 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 the current limited regime of the, the mismatched load, we can always add, a uh, add one reactance in series with RL. So therefore the combination of the two will give us a higher load impedance we can always increase the XL such that the, the drain arc voltage swing at the PA node will reach its maximum value of the VDD, right? The maximum reactance and the XL is now defined as can be calculated as the, the square root of one minus K square times R optimal. And before, it's, before the whole load is reaching the maximum voltage swing and, uh, and defined by the load line, of course, in this case, the voltage current will not be in phase anymore because the load is complex, right? So uh, anyhow, and um, uh, for the for given RL and also the fixed power degradation factor K and, uh, and the resulting RL plus JXL and, uh, and the curve essentially follows a constant resistance circle on the Smith chart showing on the right. And on this trajectory, the PA generates the same upper power with the same power degradation factor. Right. Very similarly, we can look at the case when the load, real part of load is actually larger than our optimal. And in this case, and the, the device is operating in the voltage limited regime in the sense that it achieves maximum output voltage, but without reaching the maximum output current. So similarly, we can put another in the kind of reactance in, the, in parallel and the visit. And we can see that you know, for the same upper power for this and the same power degradation factor, the, the impedance trajectory follows this uh, and uh, kind of uh, the, the, the constant conductance circle on the on the screen chart. Now, if we combine the two together, and this will form the full load pool control with the same upper power with the same deep power degradation factor, and then we can plot this contour for different level of k and uh, as a set of contours. This is essentially the the, 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 the where the load pool contour is coming from. So now if, we, if the device output capacity is excluded, right? for example, if we look at the, this load plane and the plane number one, then the optimal load is real. Then uh, ideally, the load pool contour should be symmetric between the inductive and the capacity region of the switch chart. Right? So in this, this is a particular example, I have some numbers here. I will not go through the details. But if we look at the load pool contour two, where we are outside of the device parallel and opposite capacitance in many cases, then the um, optimal load apparently should be inductive because the inductive part will resonate out with the, this capacitor. So the local control will be rotated to the inductive half plane on the screen chart. So an actual local control for uh, 45 nanometer CMOS SOI devices at 28 gigahertz is actually shown here on the right. The red curve is uh, rep uh, basically representing the, the 1 dB upper power contour, where the blue curve represents the 5% of PAE contour. So we can, we can also uh, have other types of local contours, for example, for the PA linearity as well. But these are essentially large signal contours, and then we, we, we should choose the optimal load to fit the particular application needs. So next, it's important to understand the PA linearity distortions that are often described using both AM to AM and also AM to PM distortions. 
So if we have, a, uh, for example, a sine wave and uh, input, right? We know that for a simple LTI system, linear time environment system, the output will still be a sine wave. And just with a scaled amplitude and the and the and, and the altered phase, right, which is a uh, and which can be completely described by this complex and the transfer function and the HS as the at the fundamental frequency, right. And uh, but for a nonlinear system with memory effect, for example, and if we only look at the fundamental terms, right, and the, the output signal will have many terms because of the nonlinearity. But let's say we only look at the relevant uh, fundamental terms and uh, at the output part, at the output and ignore all the other terms. The resulting output will still be a sine wave because we only look at that fundamental term. But the amplitude and the phase of the sine wave will change both depending on the fundamental frequency, omega zero, and also the amplitude of the input A. So therefore we can see that these are nonlinear distortions now, both in the amplitude and also in the phase. So we can further show this in the IQ constellation plot. If we have AM to AM in the distortion, which is actually gain compression or expansion, so and uh, shown in the, in the, uh, as a figure on the left, when we have AM to PM distortion, this, we will show this as a rotation of the constellation on the, on the constellation plot shown on the right. right? For, for example, for 10% of uh, the, the amplitude AM to AM error, uh, basically, and the four, um, and, uh, and the 1 dB AM to AM distortion contributes almost equally as, let's say, 60, 6 degrees of AM to PM distortion. So therefore, we can see that the um, excellent PA design, we really need to have the balanced performance, balanced and the linearity of both AM to AM and also AM to PM, right? So at the same time, the in reality, the AM to AM and the PM should be measured versus the upper power. And uh, uh, an example in the, in the measurement should, is shown here as the 28 gigahertz PA, and uh, on the right, which is the AM to AM distortion, and then we register as the OP1 dB is about 2.8 dB lower than the P set, and the AM to PM distortion at OP1 dB is about 6.3 degrees, right? A very common performance. So both AM to AM and the PM performance and will lead to the in band distortions as the EVM degradation and of the transmitted uh, and the constellation. So essentially, this and the constellation start to distort. Right, and uh, this is called in-band nonlinearity. And uh, there is also another term called auto-band nonlinearity or auto-band distortion. And this is essentially the, the refers, refers to the special regrowth and uh, resulting in the adjacent channel and leakage ratio ACRR degradations. So the last figure shows a measured and the AM and the millimeter PA output at the and the and the, and the lower of average upper power and the, with less linearity versus higher upper power versus uh, with higher linearity and, uh, at, uh, and uh, both at the, you know, for the same PA, right? We can see that the, essentially that the tolerance on the in-band out of band the, the distortion based on the particular applications will eventually set the maximum modulated power a PA can deliver in practice. So, well, we may have yeah. to where, where, are the sources, yeah. where are the sources of no. PA large signal linearities, right? So, if yeah. you look at the equivalent elements in a power device, most of them they are done in there, and they contribute to the AM to AM and AM to PM distortions. So, typically, we can use the Taylor and the series and the without and the, um, the memory or usable Taylor series with memory effects. So, to model these nonlinearities. So then next, we can focus on several major nonlinear mechanisms and see and uh, the popular techniques to mitigate them. Right? For example, the first one is called the transconductance nonlinearity. This is also called the GM nonlinearity. It is often the major reason for AM to AM distortions. The GM nonlinearity is biased is biasing dependent. We know if we plot the linear term in GM and the, and the signal order term in GM2 and the third order term GM3, and versus the VGS and the biasing voltage, we can find that, you know, that the VGS and the, and the biasing, we can find the particular VGS biasing where the GM3 is zero, right? This is called a sweet spot GM biasing, right? And uh, then the, however, as we can see that, that this is probably only valid for small signal levels because this GM3 is around zero only across a small signal range, which is typically not applicable for PAs. For large signal PAs, we want to expand this so-called zero GM3 region to support large signal drive. We need to uh, and, uh, and, uh, have some additional uh, tricks, right? We notice that the GM3 
and has the opposite sign above and below this uh, GM3 uh, optimal biasing point. So therefore we can essentially have multiple devices put in, the, in parallel and uh, bias and gate at different voltages and then combine them together. So the total effect in zero GM3 will be, um, will be in the held and over a wider power range. This is called multi-gated uh, um, transistor techniques, MGTR technique. The schematic shown on the, on the, on the upper right with four transistors is, is, is an example. We can see that the, the simulated IMD3 and uh, really shows that this will have substantial reduction with, by using this MGTR technique. Okay, so for the AM to PM, the linearity input capacitor CGS is often the major cost and sometimes the, 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 actually the, the, the output device and the, and the output capacity can be a reason. Sometimes the GM compression can also lead to AM to PM distortion. But in many cases, the, the input CGS and distortion is typically the major reason for the AM to PM distortions, right? So uh, and, uh, it is shown that the, GM, the CGS nonlinearity can be actually canceled by using NMOS and the PMOS and, uh, and the variator or and the transistors and the, and in parallel, right? Because they have opposite the A and the, the capacity of linearities. But this will lead to an overall larger but flatter and the in, in input uh, capacitance versus the input uh, drive voltage, right? So the, the price to pay typically is the slightly lower gain and also a narrower bandwidth, but it will help us reduce the AM to PM distortions. Okay, so another major source of nonlinearity is actually the remixing of the signal order harmonics of the PA from the output and, the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and to the input. So we can see that actually many linear PA's operations will introduce substantial signal order uh, harmonics, for example, the, and, the, and the class B PA's. For example, the PA's with certain uh, output waveform shaping like uh, and, uh, and, uh, class F inverse PA's. Right, the, such this kind of signal order and uh, harmonics can remix with the fundamental through the device nonlinearity, and uh, this will result in the additional IMD3 components at the output, then both AM to AM and, and also AM to PM distortions. So there are different ways to suppress the signal harmonics, and we can have output filtering, input filtering, and also the source node filtering. Right, so we can see that uh, the typically applying these uh, signal harmonic short circuits, we can really improve the uh, IMD3 and the performance as well. If you are interested, please refer to these two you know, example papers that are talking about the details. Now, we, when we are talking about the higher frequency and we need to consider additional, if, uh, ad additional and the effects, in particular, the device gain and the device frequency. But this is really because the fundamental challenge for these I mean, high millimeter PA designs and uh, the, the device gain is the big, biggest, uh, one of the biggest limitations, right? For example, for a two port active device, it's small signal power gain can be expressed uh, as follows and in these equations, right? We know that for the lower frequency and, uh, and, uh, and probably until the stability inflection point, the stability factor K is actually less than one. So the device is not unconditionally stable. Therefore, we have to use the definition of maximum stable gain as called MSG. And the beyond this stability point, inflection point, and uh, the device will be unconditionally stable. And we can use this expression of uh, MAG, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, which cross basically. And eventually, the MAG will cross the, the, the 0 dB and at the F max. Right? This is where we define F max. So in reality, the device gain and the F max will highly depend on the device layout the biasing and also the, the matching. So the, the, the gain of the, and the, the, and the 40, global foundry 45 and the CMOS SOI process for the frequency is shown on the right uh, for the class A and the class B and the biasing, different biasing modes. So we can see that the, although the class AB may achieve actually a higher device drain efficiency and, and uh, actually decreased F max from the, and the 334 gigahertz and for the class A mode, and two, 262 gigahertz. As a result, we can see that the, the, the device level gain drops from 10 dB to 7.5 dB. I think this is probably an, really an example to show the, um, the, the, the questions previously was asked by and the, and the team lead regarding the device and the gain degradation for different biasing, especially at the higher frequency of operations. Okay, so the active device and the layout should also be carefully optimized 
to maximize the device and the, and the FT and also FMAX for given technologies, right? So we can see that for a given device FT, if we can minimize the device the, the, in the, for the CMOS device, we can, MOS device, we can minimize the gate resistance and the CGD, we can really improve the device FMAX, right? So in practice, if we can use a smaller and the device and a finger width with more number of fingers, will reduce this RG and uh, improve the FMAX. Right? But the upper and the right figure and it shows the, the simulated FMAX and the for a 45 nanometer CMOS SOI power device with different gate finger width. Uh, we can see that a smaller finger width and will improve the, the FMAX. And the FMAX will be maximized as around the one or million per micron of biasing current density, right? But more number of the fingers will eventually, we know, will increase other device parasitics such as gated distribution resistance and also the, the inductance. So there's really a limit about the how small we can go in practice for the device finger width. So therefore, and, uh, and we need to consider all of these things uh, holistically. Typically, we need to have full EM simulation even at the device level to, and, uh, and also device parasitic extractions to really find the optimal configuration and for the particular application for the particular frequency of operation. Okay, so we know that uh, and the, and the millimeter PAs often use the neutralization technique to cancel the device parasitic feedback uh, like CGD in the MOSFET. So to improve the gain and also stability. And a popular technique is to build this differential and, uh, and, and, uh, and amplifier and use cross-couple capacitance. And here it's called CN. But the CN can provide feedback current with the opposite sign and, uh, and uh, then therefore cancel the intrinsic CGD and, uh, and, uh, and the feedback. But this is what I want to mention that this is also a broadband neutralization solution and that can unilateral the device and boost the gain and enhance the stability. The resulting device gain is actually close to the Mason's and the device unilateral gain and the U, which has a minus 20 dB per decay of behavior over frequency. And um, the gain versus the, the, the gain versus the, at the frequency of interest versus the neutralization capacitor can be plotted and, uh, and for different neutralization capacitor values and is shown at this volcano curve. And right, so typically the, the CN is chosen in the middle of this volcano curve just to make sure that the design robustness against the process variation, right? So the, the we, uh, often people also use the, the MOS directors as a CN so that they can better track the process variations. So on the other hand, neutralization will result in the, in the, in the high, very high input impedance that will actually make complicated your input matching. Right? And also the parasitic inductance and the resistance of the, and the capacity, you know, neutralization capacitor will impact the neutralization, particularly at a higher frequency, because it, they will have their self resonant frequency as well. So all of these should be and, uh, carefully considered and extracted and, uh, by EM simulations and um, for these high frequency and the designs. So, well, next we can move to the design of the passive networks, right? So we, and the, for the, as a previous example, right? And if we assume that we want to build a single end PAs with VDD of 2.5 volt, knee voltage of 0.2 volt for 30 dBm upper power, that the optimal load will be 2.6 ohm. And this will require a 19 ohm, a 19 and times and the impedance transformation down from 50 ohm, right? This example really shows that the passive network design challenges because we don't have a lot of voltage swing for silicon devices. Therefore, we need to have smaller load resistance to generate high output power. Then we need to have high impedance transformation ratio or power combining. And all of these will lead to more loss and, uh, and the bandwidth limitations and make, the, and make it even more difficult for commodity controls. And, uh, and uh, all of these need to be considered for the upper matching network. Right. So um, let's look at several general approaches of uh, upper matching network. The first example is this L match network, right? For the upper left example, we were first place and the inductor LP in parallel with the load and then put the, and the capacitor in series. I think through the parallel to series conversion, we can see that how and uh, the impedance will be changed and the LCS is defined and is designed so that it will resonate out with LS leaving the resistance and the, the resistive load, which equals R0 divided by one plus QP squared. Q is a quality factor 
of this LP and RP and R0. And uh, similarly, there is this duality of the designs, which we will have placed the capacitor first and then inductor in series, right? The combination of these two is essentially the full set of this so-called L match. And then we can plot the, the, the both the networks on the switch chart. We can see here that starting from 50 ohm, if we first have an inductive parallel inductance and then series capacitance. We will land on this RL as example, 12.5 ohm. And similarly, if we first have a parallel capacitor and a series inductor, and we can get to the same value as well. So these two networks are duality with each other. Okay, so both of them are and the viable in practice. So one can also extend this concept and then build a T-line based on the mesh network for higher frequency uh, operations. And uh, also, and uh, we can use the equivalent and the impedance upcom transformation network and that uh, can be built as well, right? So on the other hand, right, in many cases, one section of error match will have direct trade-off of impedance transformation, network Q value, bandwidth, and also passive efficiency. And for a large, for example, for a large impedance transformation ratio, we will, have, uh, we will require a large network Q and which will degrade the network passive efficiency and as well as the bandwidth. So we can show on this Smith chart by right, transforming 50 ohm to five ohm, the network value Q will require will be a factor of three, which is higher, much higher than the uh, Q value. We, we want to transform 50 ohm to 12.5 ohm, right? Well, the solution to reduce the Q is to use multi-section error match. As you can see that here, that we, we use three section error match and we can get to the same value of RL equals five ohm from 50 ohm, but only with a maximum Q of the network of 1.07. This is a, that's a reduction of the Q. And, uh, but at the same time, we, we, we need to uh, realize that it will require more complexity, more chip area, and more passive loss as a result. So nevertheless, and uh, the, the, the multi-section network has been used and uh, widely used, and also it can be extended to high order reactive matchings that is actually, yeah, very popular approach as well. So in the past uh, several, uh, I think two decades probably, the on-chip transformers have been widely used in RF and millimeter PA designs and uh, uh, circuit design in particular for PA designs. Um, so, uh, and uh, there are different ways to model the on-chip transformers. I'm showing them here. Next, I really want to show that one of the major advantages of transformers for RF and linear PAs. But this schematic shows a very and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, kind of simple, simplified uh, one stage and the PA network and PA and the power stage with input and output and the transformer based network. As we can see that the, at the PA output, the transformer will act as a balen with a differential to single ended conversion. So that's, a, that's the advantage and use of the transformer. It can also combine the power from the two differential and branches. That's why the phase and amplitude matching of them is very important so that we can have efficient combining. It also can perform the building impedance transformation as well, depending on how we design the transformer. That's another advantage. Moreover, the primary side of the transformer is typically connected with the, 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 with the differential PA. So therefore we can use the center tab to allow and the VDD and DC feeding without using any RF chokes. This improves the performance, if frequency performance. This also reduces the chip area required. We can actually add additional filtering network at the center tab to provide even other harmonic controls, which will be useful for PA such as class F, F inverse or class J PAs, right? Or to provide the linearity improvement as a signal harmonic short as we just mentioned earlier as well. Now with the Balen operation and the, and, the, and the transformer can naturally enable differential PAs that will allow the capacity neutralization. That's another advantage of these using this differential and transformer based PAs. And the neutralization will be broadband gain enhancement as well as stability improvement. At the input, we can also use transformer to couple this PA, right? The, the, um, we can use a differential transformer that essentially will block the common mode signal propagation between the stages. This improves the, this improves the stability and as well. Uh, it also does the input matching too, and depending how we design this transformer, right? And one thing is, one more thing which is very important is that 
with this transformer, we can use the center tab of the transformer to bias the, 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 the gate and or base of the, of the PA device uh, without, using, without using any large biasing resistors. Then the biasing network will have a very small and the time constant with low memory effects. This will enable geekers very faster than in biasing and which are critical for millimeter PA and the 5G designs too. So here is an example of how to design a practical and the designs uh, is an upper match network for uh, 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 millimeter P at 28 gigahertz. I will not go through all the details, but you can see that and uh, this transformer essentially achieve all these functionalities just within using one transformer. And, uh, and uh, it can achieve all of these and uh, essentially in a very compact the form factor too, yeah. Uh, further boost the, to further boost the PA upper power, and we know that uh, in many cases, impedance transformation is not enough. We have to have some kind of power combining, right? We just have to, uh, to combine the upper power from multiple PA devices, right? So, and the, the, typically the, the different power combining techniques can be divided into three categories, right? The first one is the direct parallel power combining, for example, right? We call it, sometimes it's being called a zero phase power combining, but they are all the same thing. So it is simple and compact, and, but typically it does not offer a lot of isolations among the amplifiers, right? So that's the advantage and also disadvantage. The signal type is this kind of distributed power combiners, and we can use the Wilkinson power combiners, we can use the, and the Gizzo power combiners, for example, and uh, we can also use quadrature power combiners. So they typically support good isolations and, uh, and, uh, and uh, among the stages. They can also provide asymmetric power combining as well, but they are often very bulky and can be bandwidth limited as well. And the third type is actually this uh, transformer based power combining, and they can be compact in the broadband with infinite transformation. They can also support many implementation variations that we'll, we'll discuss next. Okay, so if we use transformers, and uh, the, we can enable both series and the parallel power combiners, right? Show on the left, this is the series power combining and uh, power trans uh, transformer. Essentially, it will add up all the uh, output voltages from different PAs together in a coherent fashion in a signaling term so that the NPA branches will effectively uh, combine in series, which enables the natural downscaling of the, the load impedance for each PA. That we, as we can see, that is very useful for high power PAs. Uh, in parallel, we can also perform parallel power combining and by adding up all the output current of the PAs in this configuration shown on the right. So in this case, the M and the PA branches uh, are effectively combining parallel, which enables a natural upscaling of the PA load impedance, right? So in this case, as a circuit duality. So, um, uh, in addition, right, and, and there have been and the research work on using this hybrid series and power, parallel power combining to really achieve the optimal and, uh, and the performance for the power combining. And this has been reported as well. So in addition, the transformers can be used to build broadband and high order matching network for wideband PAs. And I'm showing two popular examples. The one on the left is to use transformer network to realize the band pass ladder based filters which um, <clears throat> while the one on the right essentially use transformers to realize a coupler and a coupled resonator and the filter and the architectures. We don't have time to go through all the design details here, but I'm, I'm, I'm showing all the network transformation and the steps and the, just for your reference, right? And the important thing is that both networks, the one on the left and also the one on the right can realize impedance transformation over a very wide, band, a wide bandwidth because they are, and they are network prototypes are wideband. And, and uh, therefore they are very useful for broadband PAs. And also both examples can be cascaded uh, for, to achieve high order networks to further extend the bandwidth, right? Okay, so for the passive network, I think there was a previous question regarding the distributed network versus the lumped network. Indeed, this is a very important discussions. When we move to higher millimeter frequencies, the lumped transformer network designs are typically more restricted. And uh, because they have limited self resonant frequency, the lumped transformer should be, we have to design to be very, very small with narrow traces. 
and uh, and uh, to achieve and to, to ensure higher self resonant frequency, then we can still use them as a transformers. But the, in those cases, they will be very sensitive to parasitics. They will be also very sensitive to the routings, and that they will actually also have low coupling as well. The on-chip and the, in the coupled lines balance and uh, for these high frequencies you know, becoming a very popular choice um, and uh, with very versatile designs and uh, at higher frequencies, for example, 140 gigahertz and above. So a generic coupled uh, and, uh, a coupler balance is shown on the left. And the port two and the port three are the differential ports and the port one and, the, and the essentially the single and the, lo the load. As we can see that, um, and the, because the coupler balance typically will have some kind of intrinsic in symmetry, then we can use even mode or an odd mode analysis to understand the impedance transformation and also the bandwidth of the, uh, of the couplers. So an example coupler balance is shown here and with vertical coupling of two metal layers, very common in, the, in this using CMOS process, a silicon process. So with a compact footprint, we can see very compact, it achieves a wide band low loss operation from <clears throat> 90 gigahertz all the way to 180 gigahertz, just using one coupler and in a very compact footprint. The, the, and the amplitude also phase balancing and uh, actual excellent over this 70 to 190 gigahertz, right? That's the advantage of using couplers, right? So summarize the, 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 the coupler balance properties. It offers low loss and broad bandwidth as we can see, it can naturally absorb P uh, and the device output capacitance for and the very compact designs. And they actually also ensure uh, high common mode rejection and almost a zero even mode transmission. This is a big advantage. This guarantees the balancing of the differential impedance and, the dif and, the co and also in phase differential signal propagation because it will block any common mode signals going to the output. It will also offer the building impedance transformation and, uh, and also many other and, uh, design and uh, variants and properties, right? For example, and in our previous paper, we have shown that the copper balance can be used to realize impedance inverting or scaling. It, it can be found that this behavior, impedance inverting or scaling behavior really depends on the phase of S21 if we define the ports like in this way uh, of the copper balance. If the phase is around plus minus 90 degrees, that the network behaves as an impedance inverter balance. So when basically when the when the load increases, the, 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 the driving impedance actually decreases. Okay. If the phase is zero to or 180, it is scaling balance. Essentially, the driving impedance, differential driving impedance will scale and the, the, together with the load impedance. <coughs> These properties will be very useful for to build advanced PAs, such as Doherty PAs. And the, or out facing PAs at the higher millimeter frequency. So, moreover, and the coupler balance can be cascaded, can serve as a series power combiner to further boost the upper power. And uh, I, I will show you and, uh, as one of these examples later. Okay, I think this concludes the signal part of the presentation. So, if there are any questions, I can happy to answer. Okay, hi, uh, I see Kevin. Um, I'm asking you to unmute. Please unmute yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, hi, Professor Wong. So thanks a lot for very informative uh, talking. So I have two general questions. So one is uh, for the uh, millimeter wave of PA, usually we need to uh, multiple stage because each state has limited gain. So is there any uh, strategy on the power supply on the ground uh, for each stage? Let's see. Do we need to separate the power supply and ground for the driver on the last stage? So that's the first question. And the second <coughs> question, and you just mentioned the distributed copper balance. So at what particular frequency we should uh, say, uh, choose the distributed uh, uh, design instead of the lamp transformer? Okay, that's a, uh, and uh, thank you for the question. So first of all, I think, and uh, it's kind of common practice that we want to separate the, the supply voltage for uh, the the driver and also the PA. Uh, at least you need to. We want to make, ensure a very good bypass between the two. This is really for the consideration of the stability because we don't want to have any feed through and uh, and uh, feedback through the the supply lines. That's the main consideration. However, as I know that the in many actually the product level designs 
sometimes having separate supply lines is not feasible. Then in that case, you need to really carefully model that supply lines and also bypass and uh, adding to it. That's important. To address your signal question, uh, to what frequency we should consider using this uh, and uh, cassette the copper rebellion? Well, I would like to say that um, this is useful for higher frequency. The higher the frequency we go, it will be more useful compared to the transformer. It's probably hard to make uh, exactly you know, the, what is the cutoff line. But I, I will, as I will show you later, this technique can be used very nicely for 60 gigahertz PAs to have efficient and in in-phase power combining and form a and the kind of a, the DAT structures. I will show you later. Okay. Good. I hope yeah. that answers your question. Okay. Yeah, thank sure. you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, okay. The next one, uh, Lee Lee, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Pro Professor Wang. Uh, I have a question on the power combiner. So uh, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, some combiner is not isolated. Uh, yeah. So I'm curious in, in which scenarios the isolation can be an issue because, you know, for transistor, the transistor itself is unilateral, meaning the S21 is much bigger than S12. So I'm just curious when the isolation can be an issue in terms of the PAD line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so here the isolation, I'm not talking about S21 or S12 kind of input output isolation. I'm talking about isolation between the ports. Okay, this is particularly an issue if, you, if the PA you are designing, um, okay, has a tendency that some of the branches may fail during the operation. Or you want to design the PA with a very high reliability that even some of the branches will fail, other branches should operate and uh, uh, still the same and with high reliability. Then you need to choose the, the, the combining the combiner to, uh, topologies where that will give you better isolations. Okay, I see. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Uh, next question, Please. Sarah. Please unmute yourself, Sarah. Hello, Professor, and forgive my voice because it's just five here in Zurich. Uh, I wanted to ask you one question about the load pool measurements for uh, device characterization as like a uh, device um, characterization point of view as a de device designer. I wanted to ask you that how is uh, the input power, like for example, the, the single tone continuous wave is going? Oh, okay, so I guess uh, your question is about- affect uh, our PL that we are going to- uh, I think your, your voice is a little bit uh, and, and, uh, breaking up, so. Uh, Sarah, you... really, we missed the last part of your question. Can you repeat? Uh, so my question is about the load pool characterization of the devices from a device design point of view. When yep. we are doing only uh, like single tone measurements, is that going to affect our gamma L? Like if like, for example, the input power is only a single tone. And also one more question is about like the, the level of the P in when we are actually considering our uh, best or our optimum gamma L. So like at different P ins. So for example, at uh, P in minus one dB or like six dB back off, our gamma L is going to be different. So uh, what will be like the best way to consider the uh, optimum gamma L? Oh, that's a very good question. And I think that you have a good experience on the device level calculation, I, I'm sure. So uh, and the, the, this really depends on the application, right? So uh, in many cases, when we start a design, we have to start from somewhere. And then we actually often use the, the single tone as the, in the stimulation, as the, as the excitation source so that we can define and find the optimum gamma L, right? And, uh, but eventually, I think in many of, uh, of the application design practice, later on, you want to polish the PA. Often you may want, also want to even use the modulated tone to do that. And then going back to your question regarding the, whether we should use the, 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 what is the level of the input power, input signal we should use to find the gamma L. Totally, it really depends on the, the input, right? So again, this goes back to the, what kind of PA you are uh, designing, 
right? So uh, if you are designing a normal class A BPA and, uh, and then the, uh, this, the, 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 input, the input voltage or power level also depends on what kind of driver you can have and the breakdown of the driver and the, and the supply voltage driver limitations too. So with that consideration, you can kind of more or less understand what is the input maximum input voltage drive. And based on that, you can, <clears throat> you can design, design input drive and then you can design the, the, the gamma L, optimum gamma L. Now, uh, and, uh, but for other type of PAs, for example, Doherty PAs, and the main PA should operate and at the 6 dB power back off by itself and before any active load modulation is being turned on. So in that case, you should use actually uh, back to off and the input drive so that you can, we can find the optimal and the, and the gamma L. So uh, for in those back off case. So I think it depends on the applications, yeah. But for the basic practice, class AB PAs, uh, as, as a starting point, I think you can certainly use the, the continuous wave and, uh, and, uh, and uh, let's say around the input 1 dB or 1 dB compression point and the input drive to, to, to find your uh, starting point of the gamma L and then start your optimization from there. Okay, uh, next question, Fabio, <clears throat> please unmute yourself. Um, Professor Wang. Uh, a consideration about uh, how we measure stability. Now, in the slide uh, that you presented, it was measured with K. Of course, it can yeah. be also the mu, uh, they're interchangeable. Uh, yeah. But is that enough for power amplifiers? Because as far as I'm aware, uh, K or new parameters, one, either one or two, are of course, indeed, uh, necessary conditions for stability, uh, but not sufficient. For example, we might need to, to add another one like uh, the determinant, for example, S11, S22, minus uh, S21, S12. Um, is this uh, relevant or it, it is enough? It is to... very relevant. And uh, I see, and, and uh, I, I think you, you raise a very good point. I kind of purposely don't want to go to the details here. And uh, it, okay, so for the stability characterization, it depends on the, for the actual, you know, it. We, we should talk about theory, we should also talk about, about the practice, right? So the theory that uh, yes, and uh, you know, and that uh, you can use the, and the, and the, and the, and the V factor and the, and the K or and the, and the, and the mu, and, uh, but these are, in reality, they are all small signal estimation and small signal characterization of stability, right? The PA is actually a large signal thing. Doing that large signal driving is biasing, is changing, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, constantly and uh, through your driving. So therefore, and the, in many cases, we also need to ask, uh, and uh, we also need to model the large signal stability of the PA2, right? So there are actually, you know, uh, the, uh, essentially you need to, there are different type of uh, way to test the PA stability for the large signals. So I think in the, uh, in the practical designs, that's, very, that's actually even probably even more important than checking the small signal stability. Yeah. Thanks, Professor. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, next one is Yilong, Long Jiao. Hi, Professor Wang. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, my question is uh, in terms of the um, balen uh, design, especially the the copper balen. I think it's um, it's mostly for, for like CMOS technology, right? Because for gamma nitride, usually there are just like two metal layer that we can access for is at least for UMS or wind semiconductor, they just have two layers of metal and why is the common ground? So it seems it's very hard to design the, uh, the transformer using GAN technology. <laughs> and that's a very good point. And uh, we also have some successful and unsuccessful experience and of porting this type of, uh, this topology to different the process. It really depends on the backend option you have for particular technologies, right? So I can see that, I can say that, okay, but well, we, we can do this in Indian phosphide technologies because it uh, does give us enough metal layers. And for the GAN process, it depends. And uh, as you said, yeah, if you only have two metal layers and one's ground, and uh, it's probably hard to use. Well, maybe you can choose to use, and uh, for example, as a, 
uh, and uh, basically the, the the edge coupling, but then the coupling coefficient will be limited. Your design freedom will be limited, right? So uh, yeah, it depends on the it depends on the and the really depends on the process. Okay, Shushil Kumar. I think you are unmuted. You can speak. <clears throat> okay, let's go to next one. Uh, yes, Sheer, please unmute yourself. Hello, Professor Wang. Uh, uh, my oh. question is uh, regarding the uh, when you were talking about the voltage limited and current limited uh, at the drain terminal where both the current and voltages were in both scenarios, not in phase. So are there any techniques to make them in phase? Because inherently, if they are in phase, we will get maximum power out of the transistor, obviously. If oh, they yeah. come in phase. <clears throat> Certainly. Here I'm talking about the, 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 the cases when they are not in phase, when you have mismatched the load, and also you have additional reactants. Now this will, I mean, just by circuit theory, if your load is not uh, in the real and, uh, and the, they will have mis mismatched the face, right? So I'm not talk talking, I'm not here referring to a, a desired design case. The, this is the, actually the, the, the case is to analyze the load mismatch conditions. Okay. In reality, yeah, in the actual designs, we always want to try to We'll, we'll uh, make sure they align the same phase as you mentioned, so that we can have optimal output power and also efficiency for sure. Okay. Okay. Uh, Sushil Kumar, can you unmute again? I think you're unmuted. Can you speak? Maybe you have a problem with the microphone. All right, uh, I guess we can move on, Professor, um, and we can probably have one more quick Q&A at the end. Yeah, I, sure. And uh, considering the time, I, uh, I think that probably should, uh, I prefer to finish my presentation, then we can ask the question maybe at the end, at the end of my talk. Yeah, yeah please or go. Right, so, okay, next I want to, I want to show you, uh, and we have introduced the, all the, the PA fundamentals, I think, and try to give you a summary of all the PA fundamentals from different uh, aspects. So next I want to uh, present the multiple popular mini PA architectures and also design examples. Okay, so uh, uh, my group has been really working on the RF mini PAs in the past several years. This is actually the list of our um, the example PA designs, right? The focus is of course on Upper power efficiency and the linearity and the finding a balanced solution that can deliver all these threes at the same time. Right. The we, we look at the PA topologies, right? The, the research in the in the in the in the sibling based minimum PA really start roughly in the early 2000s. Uh, the, the basic class AB PAs since then and still till now are the mainstream PAs in most of the millimetry systems. So I'm showing some of the class A B P S here as example designs. They offer good balanced performance because they offer good balanced performance in terms of uh, efficiency, linearity, and the multiple bandwidth. They are also this kind of called RF in RF out P A with no need for any real time controls, and uh, and uh, and make the they, therefore they are, it's very compact and they are very easy to um, to to be absorbed into the system integrations. So. As a result, class AB PAs are still serving as a workhorse PAs in many military and uh, communication or sensing applications. But right here is a really the, uh, a collection of examples here. To boost the efficiency beyond the basic class AB PAs, right, one approach, as I mentioned earlier, is to explore the harmonic combinations. So there are many harmonic termination PAs, uh, and, uh, and the most of, many of them, they are actually kind of narrowband. In the 2011, I think I believe Steve, when Professor Steve Cripps, their group then started this concept of the continuous mode harmonic tuning PAs, which have been widely used successfully for 3 5 compound PAs. It allows a certain phase shift and amplitude variation of the harmonics, but yet still achieve the broadband and efficient PA operations. 
So another work and from uh, Virginia Tech and, and uh, in the past, and actually present this uh, class F inverse and the class F exchange PAs at the ICC 2014, which is also a very interesting topology. So my group, we also look at this and uh, this, the, the, this topic, right? Our goal is different. We are trying to, uh, our goal is to substantially reduce the area of continuous mode harmonic tuning PA network at the PA output, right? Instead of using a complex, complex network with many passive elements, we are trying to and, uh, and realize a broadband continuous mode in this example, uh, class F inverse of matching network using only one on-chip transformer. The, the trick here, the idea here is to leverage and, and engineer the passivity effects of the transformer so that it can achieve the desired harmonic level and the terminations for the class F inverse operation. So the figure on the right essentially shows the, 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 the different harmonic terminations and we can see, see that yes, and achieve the wide band kind of class F inverse kind of implementation. And, uh, and, and also because it's a class F inverse, so the signal harmonic at the PA output is actually being emphasized. And we know that this will lead to poor PA and the linearity if we don't do anything about it. So therefore in this particular design, we also used the input signal harmonic short to kill the, the remixing, to suppress the remixing of the signal harmonic feedback and the with the fundamental inputs and then reduce the, the resulting IM3 components and improve the linearity of the PA. But the PA schematic and also the chip microphotograph are shown on the, on the left here. You can see that everything is being achieved at the output using only one transformer, but we are trying to leverage and emphasize its parasitics and of this transformer to achieve this class F inverse and the continuous mode tuning network. The work was published at the ICC and to the 2018. To further boost the PA large signal and the performance and achieve a very flat OP1DB and the PAE over a wide frequency range. Micro, we also look at the use of this on-chip coupler and as a wideband power combiner, but this is one application of the on-chip coupler. And the previously we have seen that, that, yes, this is useful for very high frequency, but here is an example to show that it is also useful for around 20 to 40 gigahertz of applications. I will not go through the details here, but the, but the, 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 the resulting design is, it looks like a transformer, but is actually behaving not as a transformer. The reason that you can see that the trace, and the, we, when we model it using a coupler, the trace we can allow the, the width to be very wide, to be 29 micron. If we model this as a transformer, we can see the self resonant frequency is only 27 gigahertz. And, uh, certainly not useful for something like even to 40 gigahertz because self resonant frequency at 27 gigahertz. And the, but we are in modern, we model this as a, as a coupler balloon. We can essentially both utilize the magnetic coupling and also capacitor pack coupling from input to the output. And it actually behaves very well. And from under 20 -ish gigahertz all the way to more than 40 gigahertz. And the resulting real and the imaginary part and it's actually very stable, well-behaved, and, uh, and the passive efficiency is also excellent. And uh, from 24 gigahertz to 42 gigahertz, over 80, 80, 86%. And uh, due to the wide and also large and, uh, and the turns of this, of this coupler. So we use it as an upper matching network for a single branch differential PA from operating from 25 to 43 gigahertz. The chip area is also very compact. And, uh, and uh, with only 0.21 millimeters square as the core area. And this is actually highly desired for large scale array applications. This work was published at ICC 2020. Okay, we actually further look at for this class AB like PAs. We will further look at how we can, we look at on the passive side, right? We also want to look at the active side. We want to see how we can further improve the device efficiency uh, and uh, itself for the PAs and then Basically, as one of the designs, we come up with this class called so-called class W or dual drive PAs. So essentially, and uh, if we look at all the classic PA theory and uh, all the classic PA designs, they are using the transistor as a two terminal device. For example, we drive them at the gate and uh, ground the source and then we look at the output from the drain, right? That's it. And this two terminal assumption is essentially the basis for almost all the classic PA analysis if we look at the PA design books. And the, which 
then we can set the, 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 then we can, based on which we can define all the PA classes and waveforms like class A, class B, class AB, which then will set all the limitations of the PA efficiency, right? So and in addition, we can see that a factor of one minus knee voltage divided by VDD, we know uh, presented earlier is due to, is, is actually another limiting factor on the efficiency and, uh, and uh, due to the finite knee voltage. Okay, the, the, uh, we we'll look at how we can break this limitation, right? So basically one approach is to operate the device as a true three terminal device in the sense that we drive the gate and the source together, but in the opposite phase in this example. Right? In this case, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and the, when the PA drain voltage is low and the source is, can also swing low, and this allows the drain voltage to go down even further. This will reduce the trial the operation of PA and will present an effective, much lower PA knee voltage, and then as a result, improve the PA drain efficiency. The PA was actually demonstrated in global foundry 45 nanometer CMOS process over the 23 to 34 gigahertz, and it was presented in ISC 2021. And the resulting PA is quite a wide band with good efficiency and linearity. And by using this, class W and the dual drive on the, of operation to improve the device performance intrinsically by itself. But you know, as a, at the same time, and, uh, and we should also, we also should not overlook the limitations of this topology, right? So the major issue here I want to point out is that since we are driving the gate and source together, the total PA input impedance, if we lump them together, is that will actually drop substantially. This lowers the device power gain. As a result, and uh, the, 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 despite the PA has very high gain and the drain efficiency, the actual achievable PA will be more limited, right? And, uh, and uh, also uh, the lower power gain also means that we will require uh, and, uh, uh, and the more stages of the PA or will require higher mixer or driver of power and both of which will consume more power and the DC power. Uh, of course, this will be particularly pro problematic since we know device does not have a lot of gain for higher frequency, so this will be problematic for high frequency PA designs, right? So as an apple to apple comparison, and, uh, and the, we look at the common source PA versus a class W dual drive PA at the 28 gigahertz using Global Foundry 45 nanometer CMOS SOI process. Uh, it is, it's shown here on the right. So and this is only the PA device core simulation, right? With the, all the passes to be lossless so that we can have really the true apple to apple comparison. The dashed line here are representing the, the common source PA performance and the solid lines are for the class W dual drive PAs. We can see that the power gain drops from 16 dB at the device level to 8.5 dB by using dual drive, about 7.5 dB gain drop. And uh, this may be okay for lower frequency, but as I mentioned, go to higher and higher frequency, this will be problematic. So as a result, Although you can see that the, and the dual drive class W has a better drain efficiency and remarkably better and compared to common source, but and uh, the improvement uh, actual PAE will be smaller due to again the limit of the gain the the, the 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 gain job. Well, we may say that what about cascode? Because cascode has higher gain to start with. Maybe we are more tolerant and we, maybe we are more robust and we can tolerate more gain job. Right, so we also perform an apple to apple comparison of cascode PA versus the class W dual drive PA at 20 gigahertz and the using global foundry 45 nanometer CMOS SOI process uh, shown on the, on the right on this slide again. And, uh, and the, 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 the simulation here only use the PA device for with losses passive networks. So the dash line for the common source and uh, so the, the, sorry, the dash line for the cascode and the, the solid line for the class W cascode and we can see that the power gain also drops from 20, 20 dB um, gain to 12 point, uh, about 12.3 dB of gain. Also another like 8 dB gain job. So in this case, the drain efficiency, and, the, and also in this case, the drain efficiency is less, is actually even smaller for the class W and the dual drive PA. Why? Because the cascode now has higher supply voltage, right? And if we reduce the effective knee voltage, the effect is less significant because the, the overall supply voltage is higher. So anyhow, the improvement on actual PAE, we can see is also smaller and uh, for the bare device and the performance. If we add the input the output passive loss and uh, <coughs> the difference will also be even smaller. 
So therefore, I believe there's still a lot of room for exploration and improvement here for this type of uh, and, uh, and, uh, PA topologies. To further boost the output power at the millimeter with silicon PAs and um, the, the stacked transistor PA topology is also is being proposed and also demonstrated. The key here to, is re really to leverage different feedback, feedforward, feedforward, or even direct driving networks so that we can allow the, the device gates of the stack device to swing and uh, <coughs> in synchrony with other, with all the, and the drain voltages. This will reduce the stress of the cascade uh, uh, stacked devices and allow more devices to be stacked than beyond the conventional ca cascade PA and so that we allow the higher output power and the less impedance transformation, right? So as a result of the stack of PA will have uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, the, the uh, uh, relatively large optimal load and uh, so synch really simplified the uh, upper matching network um, can achieve a higher upper power and a higher PAE. And uh, in addition, the, the stacked uh, PA will also improve the power density of the silica devices by typically a factor of two or three, depending on how many devices we put in, in stack and how efficient the stack design is. But this potentially allows more compact integration of high power PAs, as we mentioned earlier, why it's so important. So here are a few examples of stacked transistor PAs and uh, millimeter PAs that can achieve excellent performance. We are, um, from my group, we actually took a different approach. Uh, and we look at the, the, and the, what's the more efficient way to do power combining, right? So, and the, that will be a parallel approach to the stacked PA, which essentially means can be combined together with stacked PA to achieve further better performance. So uh, we explore this cascaded asymmetric coupler valent designs for the series power combining to achieve over one watt of power at 60 gigahertz using 45 nanometer CMOS process. So cascading this uh, asymmetric power combiner will really ensure that the, that the same uh, uh, optimal load for each branch and also ensure the in-phase series power combining of each PA branches at the final output. So overall, we are able to achieve and uh, the power combining efficiently of 24 PAs together into the same output. The work was presented at ICC 2019. So, <clears throat> and uh, there was a lot of discussion about backup efficiency as we just uh, mentioned earlier and through the previous Q and A's. So when we are talking about the backup efficiency, we know we should, we really should talk about the Doherty PA design and also, and also the output facing uh, PA design. Here's a list of millimeter Doherty or Doherty light PA from different research groups. This is a list of the millimeter wave out facing PAs from different research groups. <clears throat> My group also has been working on this Doherty or Doherty light PA designs in, in, in silicon. And as an example, uh, and, uh, uh, a popular design and from my group is this and uh, our world first millimeter wave Doherty PA in 130 nanometer CG and uh, technology we demonstrated first and which can cover uh, multiple 5G bands at 28 gigahertz, 37 gigahertz, and also 39 gigahertz that can be used for compact MIMO applications and provide back of efficiency enhancement and, uh, at these bands. The, the work was published at ICC 2017 and also extended to the GSC in 2019. So, we further investigate the possibility to achieve higher power millimeter Doherty PAs, right? Here we explore this Doherty passive network based on the transformer impedance inverter and, and the uh, capacitive and the impedance inverter and the networks, right? Combination of the two. So overall the design achieves the 24 to 30 gigahertz and the linear Doherty PA with almost watt level of the power uh, at the, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, for and CMOS and uh, I think for a C, uh, 130 nanometer CD by CMOS implementation, the open network combines and the four differential PAs uh, as the main in the PA and the four differential PAs and auxiliary PA combined together. And uh, the work was presented at ICC in the 2020. Okay. So we also look at, okay, how we can, what's the best way to extend this Doherty performance PA to higher frequency, for example, 60 gigahertz. Right, so, and we leveraged our previous understanding and the discovery of the behavior for those coupler based valents. As I mentioned earlier, the way we can design them for different input to output phases will make the couplers as impedance inverting valent and impedance scaling valent. 
So therefore, we purposely design a balun as input and inverting balun, and uh, essentially it does the balun operation, but also as an input and inverter as well. And we design not, not a network as the input and scaling balun. If we combine the two together and uh, drive the two balun separately with uh, main PA and auxiliary PA, and uh, all together we'll have a Doherty PA. And the, the, here is the load simulated results, and then and the, and the, indeed this actually achieves a very nice and uh, Doherty be behavior at 60 gigahertz. The work was published at uh, and, uh, RFIC 2019 and also GSCC in uh, 2020, leveraging coupler based Doherty and uh, impedance inverting, impedance scaling networks. Okay, so. Uh, Sorry, give me one second for the, hey, whoops, I'm sorry. Let me give me one second of the, let me flip to the right side. So, okay, so the, in recent years and the Professor Steve Cripps group, group, they also proposed this very popular called the load modulated balance amplifier LMBA, right? So the LMBA use a 90 degree coupler at the output and uh, feeding the two quadrant ports using two main PAs and the isolation port and uh, using uh, and, uh, and the control amplifier or uh, of essentially a peaking amplifier or auxiliary PAs we can call it. So if we assume that the uh, output network is driven by the current sources by solving the current to voltage relationship, we can see that and the load of the two main PAs will be modulated by the current of the, and the control amplifier to achieve a backup efficient enhancement. The unique advantage here is that it can support a very wide band active load modulation, only limited by the 90 degree coupler. This is why this LMBA topology is becoming very popular in both 3 5 compound devices and also silicon and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the PA and the world. But however, it has also has its limitations. First of all, it is kind of restricted to single end PAs and uh, because of the coupler designs, or it will require additional balance or differential quadrant couplers, both of, both of them will limit the bandwidth and, uh, and uh, introduce additional loss. So moreover, the main and the control amplifiers will actually do not have equal power. And uh, so as a result, it will have additional three to four dB of gain compression and uh, in theory. So finally, and also for the up with the for the quadrant couplers and uh, with un, in the, in the desired and the coupling factors, especially at the other frequencies, it is possible for, the, for some of the PA to see negative load and uh, impedance during the load modulation. So um, well, different from the LMBA and the micro, we actually propose this coupler balance and using the coupler balance as the upper load modulation network. It is actually a combination of two, um, two couplers. So if we drive the, the, the port one, and this is a couple of balance, if we drive the port one using the differential main amplifier and then drive the port two with the auxiliary amplifier and the terminal port three and the, with the antenna load, we can actually see that the main PA's load impedance is exactly modulated by the auxiliary PA and the current. So uh, and the, we, this is actually guaranteed by this equation. So, and, uh, and we can see that the, 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 the used port of the couplers and the can be terminated, the unused port, by the way, can be terminated by and the AC and the short, which naturally will provide the supply and the, and the, and the feeding for the, for the differential and the main PA, right? So interestingly, our work and the Professor Steve Cripps LMBA work will show that both 90 degree coupler, quadrant coupler and the 180 degree balance coupler can be, perform Authority like active load modulation. That's very interesting. These two circuits probably like dualities. But however, our coupler based Balen and uh, Doherty PA has the following advantages. First of all, it allows the, the broadband active load modulation is only limited by the coupler Balen, so potentially can be very wide, wide band. And the, moreover, it supports differential PA operations so that the PA can use capacity neutralization to enhance the gain and the, and, and the, and the, and the and the isolation over a wide bandwidth. That's also another advantage. And the using differential PA, it is insensitive to the ground and the supply inductances, right? And also the main auxiliary PA here can have equal power. So therefore this ensures the no theoretical gain compression for 6 dB power backoff and, uh, and, uh, and the operation. So we first report this topology and its operation in the, uh, in the ICC 2021, and then it's followed by another paper at IMS in the 2021. So, then we actually placed the impedance inverting and, uh, and uh, basically we placed this topology 
uh, with two balance, then we can have uh, main PA and auxiliary PA. We also show that by exchanging their roles, we actually have, uh, we can further broaden the performance. Uh, this is the design and the, and the multiple design we have shown here. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and in this, uh, in this silicon platform, and we are able to show that we can cover, uh, I think, uh, from uh, the, uh, uh, I think it, it shows up from like 25 gigahertz and the, all the way to almost 60 gigahertz operation with different level of backup efficiency enhancement by using this and the, um, the continuous mode copper balance topology together with main auxiliary low exchange. It also achieves a very wide band and the modulation and the support wide band modulation as well. So this is the advantage of this design. And we further extend this work, and I'm not showing here, to Indian phosphide designs that shows that, okay, we can use this technique to cover from almost 30 gigahertz to 100 gigahertz, achieving almost three to one of bandwidth for active load modulation. So that is also and essentially set another world record in this uh, and the type of PAs. Okay, so uh, and, uh, we are talking about the, we talk about the broadband PA performance, and here we are talking about, okay, how we can actually perform better Doherty performance. I think we probably don't have a lot of time to discuss the details here. Essentially, we are using and, uh, and the mixing of Doherty topology, which is a combination of the main PA as an analog PA and auxiliary PA as a digital PA. And uh, then we can have both optimum control and the super resolution capabilities. And uh, by using and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, basically the, the, the mixed signal and the uh, analog plus the Doherty and the uh, analog plus the, and the digital combinations of the PAs. So the design was presented at the ICC 2019 and the GSCC in the 2019. I will not go through the details here, but if you're interested, you can take a look of this, of this PA. It achieved a really nice, you can see very nice authority behavior and set the record of um, and the, and the modulation based efficiency. It achieves the average efficiency in the modulation with wideband modulation of 27.8%. Yep. Okay, so further, and uh, when we place the, 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 the distorted PAs and or when we place the PAs in our practical transmitter arrays, we know that because of the unwanted coupling between the elements, the, each PA will actually see different loads, and uh, especially when we are having uh, the beam steering. And the loads and the variations will be also beam dependent, right? So the typical load variations can be as large as two to one to three to one VSWR in practice. So the following two articles are really and, uh, and, uh, and have a nice summary about this topic if you want to learn more details about this antenna, this is called antenna load variation which is a particular problem in a large array. So what is a typical two to one antenna VSLBR? If we assume the mismatch the antenna impedance is real for simplicity, therefore it can be as low as 25 ohm or as high as 100 ohms. So of course it will substantially change the PA performance and both in terms of the, the efficiency, upper power and also its linearity. So therefore the challenge here is the how to keep the PA performance even under the antenna VSWR when it is being implemented in a large array. So we work on this, we work in this space, there are a different type of designs reported already, but we work in this space by leveraging the, and the Doherty PA as well as um, and, uh, and using AI control to improve the Doherty performance over VSWR. The work was published at the GOMAC Tech and the 2019 conference and uh, also IMC 5G and 2019 and also, uh, and, uh, and also a TCAS one paper in 2020, and they're showing the how we can use uh, AI machine learning and uh, and uh, to do uh, rapid and the smart control of authority when there is antenna load variations. Well, we still can improve the ensure the, the compression and the linearity and also efficient performance of authority. At the same time, as another new direction of the PA designs, and uh, I think this is probably even gen can be generalized for military RF designs. We are using and uh, we are actually exploring using machine learning techniques to help us to do quick and the direct synthesis of different on-chip EM structures that can be used and coupled with active devices to, uh, uh, and, uh, to achieve and, uh, and the rapid prototyping of RF millimeter circuits. Again, I don't have a lot of time to talk about details here, uh, but the goal is really to ultimately achieve this uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the faster prototyping and the faster design iterations using machine learning techniques. Yeah. 
And the further, uh, the P and the, and the if we look at the power amplifiers and also in, in the larger scope transmitter designs. And uh, there's this interesting applications for uh, and, uh, latency and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the security applications and uh, also high throughput. So we are also leveraging a trans different type of transmitting transmitter MIMOs and to, to achieve physical layer security. So these are actually two and uh, just one example of that. And we published the work at RFIC 2021 and the GSCC and the 2022 and that will be as accepted, will be pub will be public published online very soon. So this is I just here I just want to show you one example of the extension of shooting uh, PA and uh, and the transmitter and the research at the system level. The, what we can do, what we can achieve. Yeah. All right. So I think that is kind of concludes my uh, the section on the PA architecture and also designs. I think and uh, uh, maybe I can. Due to the interest of time, maybe I should just directly go to the next and the, the last section and conclude my talk. And uh, if, we, if there are any questions, we can and do the Q&A in, in the end. Yeah, that will work, Professor. I think that that's a good idea. Yeah, okay. So next, I want to give a very, because of the, the brief summary about this antenna PA code design examples, right? I want to focus on the principles and uh, to show you why this is important, why this is interesting. So the conventional millimeter wave and the, and, the, and the microwave circuits designs are really designed with a, and the systems with design very uh, separate level of abstractions for devices, EM structures, and the circuits and the antennas. In, in particular, right, the circuit, typically circuit design, we design the circuits and the antenna design the with design antenna, and we only talk to each other through a standard 50 ohm interface, right? And uh, and uh, uh, we also try to always try to avoid EM coupling as much as possible, right? And however, the modern technology is offering a lot of versatile backend uh, back models as well, also, as well as essentially unlimited the cost of the devices. So the question here is that, can we actually take a different and a holistic approach by breaking the boundaries and uh, explore the code designs of devices, circuits, and EM structures altogether? For example, because devices are so fast right now and they can be well controlled and they can provide a wide variety of excitations and determinations and they can collectively synthesize and essentially any EM structures and in the near field and permitted by the Maxwell equations. So this really potentially can lead to a desired far field of relations and which will, and, uh, and, and, uh, but with a different level of reconfigurability and different level of controls. So I believe this one of the paradigm shift is really to breaking to break the conceptual boundaries and uh, and uh, and uh, and among the devices, circuits, EM structures, and really to look at the holistic design and the device designs. And I think this is the one very interesting approach, so that we can push the performance beyond what can be achieved at this moment, right? To 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 make the best and the clever use of them. Right. Since we have been showing on the, on, the, on, the, on the ETH background and also have some connection with ETH, so I have to have one slide with Albert Einstein. Right. So this is just for fun. So I believe this quote from Einstein is particularly relevant here. So essentially, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. So that's the basic last the quote. So therefore, you, if we want to push the performance to the next level, we want to push the innovation to the next level, we need to explore the next level and we will need to bring the knowledge and know-hows from other fields right, to, to enable the innovations. And with this new level of degree of freedom, we can explore and also new level of dimensions we can explore for new and, uh, innovations. So I believe the antenna electronic co-design exactly matches this research philosophy, right? So after merging the circuits with the antenna design, we can create some kind of new hybrid uh, and uh, antenna electronics with versatile on radiator and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, basically functionalities. It's not only in the radiator, and also it can serve as a signal combining, splitting, and filtering. And the antenna itself can perform impedance scaling and the uh, voltage to current and, uh, and the amplifications. And the, as a, in a passive way, and also it can achieve active load modulation and, and the, some and the, for certain designs we can I can also show you that they can achieve noise cancellation and a different level of reconfigurability as well. 
So my group has been working on this topic for the past uh, and eight years in many in many designs. I will walk through the these of some of the designs to show you the, the new on antenna and the functionalities demonstrated by the designs. Right. So for example, to boost the upper power and uh, we can use power combining techniques and the conventional power te combining techniques is to use uh, on-chip or on-package passive uh, network to sum the power from multiple devices and deliver them to the same antenna. Right? However, such passive combiners are always lossy and they will degrade efficiency, particularly when we need to sum many um, power devices altogether. That's the problem. And uh, of course, another approach is to use a spatial power combining and uh, by large antenna arrays. And this method can achieve very almost lossless power combining in the far field as long as we have perfect beam forming and with additional another 10 log n antenna gain to enhance the ERP. Uh, however, as we mentioned earlier, it will require large antenna panel size and um, it also without in a narrow beam width. And uh, for example, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, a half wavelength, half wavelength dipole will have half power beam width of 78 degrees by itself. But once we have 16 element array, the beam width will reduce to only 60 degrees. So that's a, and then the, this, uh, this such a narrow beam width will really complicate the TX RX alignment in reality, especially in dynamic and mobile environments. So, and, uh, and the, uh, these two approaches are essentially the results of the conventional constraints that circuits can only interface with one uh, with antenna using the standard and the one port and the, for example, 50 ohm interface. But if we break the constraint, as I mentioned earlier, we will find a lot of new innovation opportunities right in front of us. Right in front of us. For example, an in innovation example is to have this multi-feed antenna structure that can be driven by multiple electronic amplifiers in half wavelength. For example, if we use a half wavelength lambda and, uh, and, uh, and the, the dipole as an example, we can play with the, uh, and the output current of the amplifiers. We can make multiple ports with different current excitation so that and the, the total and the, and, the, and the current on this antenna profile and uh, the current profile is the same as the current profile on single feed antenna, then they, therefore they will achieve the same far field pattern, right? So, and, uh, and, uh, and, and but now it is, in addition to the radiation, it also achieves the power combining on an antenna itself. So this simplifies the, and the it can be shown that the load of the, and the, and the amplifiers moreover, uh, will be smaller than the, the load of a single single and, uh, antenna feed antenna. And overall it's being achieved within the same and uh, just one antenna footprint, right? This simplifies the, tra and the transformation and, the, and the increase the efficiency and still keep everything very compact. Of course, we can use them as multiple uh, elements and to an, as an array and to further enhance the upper power. So I think this is a good example of this hybrid antenna electron co-design to achieve the power combining, right? Using this and the, the, this principle, I will show you some design later on, but the, to help the circuit community better understand the hybrid antenna electronics co-design concept, I think my group actually and, uh, came up with the equivalent circuit modeling and analysis framework for these different multi-feed antennas. And uh, we it can be shown that the on antenna series power combiners and dividers can be achieved using and the multiple uh, and, uh, and using a multi feeds and uh, and uh, and uh, basically multiple feeds on uh, wire or loop antennas and uh, due to their current continuity or we can use the multiple and the near field coupled slot antennas to achieve this series power combining and uh, and uh, we can also and as a duality. The on antenna parallel power combining can be achieved using multiple parallel feeds on the on the slot type antenna, or we can use multiple near field coupled wire or loop antenna, also achieving equivalent power power combining. Right. So and uh, moreover, multi feed antennas can also behave as on antenna and the transformers, and uh, and uh, that can and that can change the driving impedance or scale the, the current voltage among each feeds, and just like a transformer. Right. So in summary, besides the radiation, the antenna is now be behaving as an import non-isolating passive networks. And, the, and the, so these properties essentially really establish the foundations of this um, and the antenna electronic code design and can help us intuitively explain that the coupling among these ports and, the, and the guide our designs and all together. So going back to the power combining case, and we use this and uh, the property of this uh, antenna power combining, 
And uh, we combine the 16 power amplifiers and driving the same four feet on chip slot antenna. And uh, the, each PA is composed of two stage cascode PA. And, uh, and then all the 16 power amplifiers are combined together on the same antenna. And the, the radiator was implemented at 60 gigahertz and using Global Foundry 45 S, uh, nanometer CMOS SOI process. And um, it's pre chip packaged. And the total chip and achieves the basically 28 dBm of power and 33.1 dBm ERP uh, at 59 gigahertz using only one antenna and one transmitter and the cell. So this is setting a, and a, and a, a world record at that time. The efficiency is also uh, pretty high at 23.4%. And uh, among the highest, and also support very, very wide band modulation as well, without any digital pre distortion. So, we also look at how we can actually further in the, 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 the problem and explore the property of, of, of this antenna, uh, on antenna kind of network. If we can use them as a passive network for power combining, we can potentially use them for active load modulation as well. So, this is the, our follow up research, and we were able to explore them and for on antenna doorly power combining. And, uh, and so the, the entire structure is, is not only uh, and, uh, and the radiator, linear radiator, it also achieves the antenna series and, uh, and the power combining and the doorly operation to enhance the backup efficiency. Right? The work was published at the ISC 2018 and the GSC in 2018. Right? Here's the summary of the performance. You can see that at around, I believe that the 62 to 68 gigahertz, about 63 gigahertz, we achieve a 1.52 times backup efficient enhancement at 60, at 60 dB PBO compared to class BPA. This is the state of the art and the, of the backup efficient enhancement. Right. It also supports very high speed modulation and uh, it, the, the modulation is undistorted over a wide, wide field of view because and the, everything is combined on the antenna and read it out. That's why it's insensitive to the field of view. Uh, that the work can be further extend to high order authority on the antenna. It was published later on at the ISC and uh, 2019. Okay, similar principle is being, uh, we, we, we took the similar principle, achieved the on antenna actually and the out facing transmitters, right? So, some of the uh, one example design is shown here was published at the RFSC 2018 and the GSCC 2019. So, this achieves and uh, you can see the substantial back of efficiency enhancement for uh, on the out facing mode at uh, 28 gigahertz. And in this case, we actually use on the, on the board on, on package antenna to achieve this on the out facing performance. Again, it supports wide band modulation as well, right? So some further study and by leveraging the, the antenna and the, on, uh, the multi feed antenna properties and because it can behave as a transformer, it can behave as an impedance scaling network it can behave as a, and a passive voltage and a current scaling network. We actually use them and uh, combine them together with L and uh, millimeter wave and uh, LNAs and together achieve on antenna noise cancellation and also on antenna and the gain boosting for the, for the low noise amplifiers as a, as a receiver by using two very closely coupled and, uh, and, and, uh, and the on-chip antennas, right? This is operating at 80 gigahertz. So, uh, I will not talk. Uh, I will not cover the details here. But the, the work was published at ICC in 2020 and also GSC 2020. So it shows that the measured noise figure of 5.5 to 4.5 dB. That is the state of the art and for CMOS receiver at this frequency. It also achieved pretty and high actually linearity. It also supports wideband and 64 quam and uh, signal without using any digital pre distortion. So we further and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, explore the uh, and then antenna electronics co-design, right? So not only for power combining, load modulation, we, can, we also explore the isolation, natural isolation of different ports on the antenna. And uh, by exploring that, then we can achieve <clears throat> actually polarization based on the duplex TRX using the same on-chip antenna shown here and using the same actually four feet drive and, uh, and the loop and, 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 and antenna uh, on chip. So uh, the orthogonal pairs are essentially naturally isolated from each other um, due to the isolation and the polarization isolation. So uh, th this was actually leveraged and, and, and for uh, 
to achieve a 60 gigahertz full duplex TRX. And we demonstrated in a 45 CMOS SOI process. And we can show that actually the chip to chip communication, this is actually the, 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 the world first chip to chip polarization based duplexing and communication with gigabit per second of uh, 64 qualm on the modulation. Right? This again, this is achieved without using any digital pre distortion and the channel equalization or and also no digital and the cancellation at the back end. Right. Uh, similarly, the, 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 the antenna electronic code design can be further explored at an even higher frequency. So here we, achieve, we use this for the, uh, this technique for power combining and uh, to achieve and, uh, uh, at the 340 gigahertz and invisible sensor nodes. Uh, and, and basically that can be used for uh, massive uh, sensor network and uh, micro robots and subdermal implants and so on and so forth applications. So I think in the lead art is really the different examples about how we can uh, leverage antenna and, and the circuits co-design to achieve new functionalities, right? So I think with that, and the, this concludes my and the, and the presentation. So and the, in summary, and, the, and the, there is plenty of space for research and innovations in the field of RF and millimeter PAs and the transmitters and the power generations. Right. I believe that the key is really come up with designs that can offer balanced trade-offs among all the uh, different performance metrics, including carrier bandwidth, efficiency, linearity, and the modulation rate. So we have presented in this uh, talk uh, PA design fundamentals. We also work through a wide variety of uh, design architectures and the design examples. Um, and um, I think in particular, I think is which is very interesting that we show that a full port Balen uh, coupler can be used for wideband authority operation, just like the 90 degree and the coupler in the LMBA. That's a very interesting example. So, but our, the, the, our valent based the coupler based authority PA can address um, different limitations of the LMBA, right? So finally, we also introduced it and also present this antenna PA co-design and antenna electronics code in general um, at the minimum frequency. So this is the end of my talk. So I uh, apologize for this long presentation and, uh, and uh, together with on the Q and A session in the middle, but uh, thank you for attending my talk. Yeah, uh, thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Professor Huang. It's uh, quite an interesting topic, as you can see. There is a huge interest from the audience, and thank you once again from from uh, on behalf of our MTT SCB uh, Silicon Valley San Francisco chapter. Thank you so much, and we will take one more shot at the questions. If anybody has any questions, please raise your hand. Uh, please use the uh, raise hand button. Okay, uh, I'm going to unmute I Ching Li. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your presentation. I I have a question that uh, what do you think of the design automation of uh, analog or RF circuit design as you introduced in your presentation with AI, and and what to extent uh, to what extent um, do you think might it replaces human engineer in industry? And that's my question. Oh, uh, uh, that's actually a very good question. We are also often asking ourselves. So I would like to say that what we are doing now is just only scratching the surface. So um, and, uh, I can certainly see that for the given topologies, if we use this, uh, we, we use these tools for design optimizations or helping us to come up with um, you know, essentially to provide expert knowledge, the so-called design intuitions and the by using machine learning network for our fixed topology and the network of circuits, this is totally feasible. And we can have a rapid in the, in the, in the, in the we can arrive at the initial design and the very rapidly and the, for the synthesis. And uh, do we have the general AI to, to, that can come up with new circuit topologies? And that is a much bigger question to ask, right? So I don't think I have an answer for that. It's a much more difficult the, 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 the problem, right? And, but I think, as I mentioned, for standardized topologies, and, uh, and the, we can use these techniques, I think I can certainly see that in the future, and the AI machine learning tools will help us uh, come up with, and uh, quickly come up with, the, initial designs and or help us optimize designs. I think it will, it will happen, yeah. Okay, thank you.
Okay, next question, Yulong Zhou. And the, by the way, I also want to add one more thing, right? So I think these tools will also help us to even port the designs from one generation of the nodes to the next generation of the nodes. So that is also very, I mean, a uh, viable and application too. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, Professor Wang. This is uh, Yulong again. And uh, in terms of uh, the antenna and the PA code design, I have two questions on that. The first sure. one is, uh, I mean, inherently the, the antenna is usually a resonant circuit, so it's kind of narrow bandwidth. So do you think it is possible to design like a uh, uh, wide band, uh, um, uh, low modulated uh, PA based on the antenna coupling? Uh, that's one question. And the second question is that, uh, Usually, the antenna is quite sensitive to the environment, which uh, provides a boundary condition, right? So I think it may be a kind of sensitive to 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 the environment, or some mismatch happens uh, in the environment for the antenna P co-design systems. So do you think it is kind of uh, a good area to do some research on, for example, if there are some mismatch or other things happens, how to characterize and uh, character uh, correct the performance of the the uh, door dpa or shriek sure. or something yeah sure. thank you uh, uh, that uh, very good questions right so i think first of all to answer your bandwidth question i think it's in many cases honestly indeed it's limited by the antenna but it uh, that actually per se has nothing to do with antenna electronics code design it's more like antenna behavior itself so therefore it will be more promising if we start with something like broadband antenna and then we are trying to figure out the parallel or series and the, and the relationship of the antenna, right? Basically, we want to find the circuit dualities or circuit equivalence of the multi feeds on that antenna. And then start with that antenna as the baseline design, and you can have broader bandwidth design, number one. Number two, the antenna electronics code design actually will give you more degree of freedoms because we can have, as I said, many active devices terminations. So it provides a certain level of reconfigurability, which if you leverage can potentially broaden your bandwidth, right? Because it can essentially, uh, to some extent, change the shape of the radiator itself. And of course that is itself is a frequency reconfigurability and, uh, and the bias nature, right? The, to answer your signal question, essentially, oh yeah, regarding the mismatch on the antenna, I think there are different type of mismatches or non idealities we want to talk about here. For some of the mismatches, again, active device reconfigurability will help us to solve the, to kind of address some of the, to mitigate, compensate for some of the mismatches, that's good. But I think we also need to talk about a bigger problem and it's kind of elephant in the, in the room that in many on-chip on antennas, uh, you know, honestly, the, the biggest problem is the substrate mode or surface or surface wave, and uh, however we call it, in the sense that the wave will propagate due to the higher dielectric constant or the thickness of the dielectric constant. The wave will propagate in the in the in the substrate, and that will actually make the antenna even behavior even more sensitive. And uh, in many cases, the wave propagating the substrate and getting reflected from the boundary of the chip and then read it out messed up your desired and the radiation or come back to alter the, 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 the performance of the radiator. So in that case, then I think this goes back to the old classic question about how we can suppress the substrate modes. And uh, the answer is that there are different ways of doing that, right? I think all of them, and also maybe we can come up with new ways to suppress the substrate modes, but all of them will help us to further in, in enhance the robustness of on-chip antennas in general and antenna electronics code design in particular. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you, Professor. And next, uh, Amit Mishra. Um, hi, Professor. Thanks for your excellent presentation. Uh, I have two questions. Um, sure. So one is more generic about uh, so in the six in sub six gigahertz re regime, I have seen more kind of switching a power amplifier such as class E or class D inverse power amplifiers. So till what frequency can these switching power amplifier be pushed uh, before they give way to the linear amplifier design? Um, my my second question is 
about the class W amplifier. Uh, so in, in class W amplifier, I see that the source was actually uh, fluctuating and that would lead, uh, I presume that might lead to VTH variation. Uh, would that lead to more AM to AM distortion issues? Thank you. Okay, so that's, a, that's a, and, uh, okay. So uh, I think you have two questions. So uh, first of all, about uh, and, uh, how high the frequency kind of we can push and, uh, and so that we can still have a PA uh, uh, for higher frequency, right? I think I kind of answered this question in the previous Q&As and, uh, and the common practice is to, 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 to go around, let's say up to one third of your F max. So if the device technology, let's say, give you F max of 450 gigahertz, then we are looking at up to 150 gigahertz and we can still design something with a reasonable gain and, uh, and the efficiency ideally, right? Of course, the lower frequency we go and typically you'll have better gain and you have better performance of the, of the PA. And, uh, and, you, and the, the, the additional gain also give you more de design degree of freedom. As you mentioned, we can do maybe switching PAs. We can do, uh, we can emphasize, we, now we have the budget to emphasize on the harmonics or we have the, the, the budget to bias the, the, the device even lower to achieve and a higher efficiency and, uh, and, uh, and uh, have a better trade-off with the linearity. So that is uh, basically my answer. Typically one third of our F max, that's a common practice. Uh, going to a signal question regarding the class WPA, um, the, the, actually the, the, due to the very fact that we are swinging the, the, the source, this actually uh, to some extent enhances the linearity because we can imagine that, right? And the, when the, uh, depending on the phase of the source voltage swing, if it's, if, if it's swinging and uh, in opposite to the gate swing, then ideally when your drain voltage is low, the source voltage is low as well. This, uh, this kind of reduces the, the period of time when the device is operating a trial. This improves the, actually the, the linearity. So as a result, you can see, we can see that at the device level simulation, and we can achieve a higher and, uh, and uh, kind of OP1DB and uh, for the same device and a slightly higher OP1DB due to the exactly same this effect. Yeah. But of course, I also want to mention that this is happening at the expense of lower power gain. Yeah. Okay, so this will be the last question for the, for the presentation. So Ali, please go ahead. Um. Hi, Professor Wang. Thank you for your presentation. So I have a question about the Doherty operation regarding the load book contours. So in some cases, um, the efficiency contour and the output part contour uh, can be very similar on the Smith chart. So I don't think it is very good situation for the Doherty operation. So how do you uh, implement the, the Doherty operation in this kind of um, the, the this kind of the load pool contour situation. Okay, so uh, the uh, the load pool contour situation. So we, um, I think this this has a lot to do with the specific of the devices and also the frequency you're operating at, right? So when the device and the, and the basically the and also device operating in large signal output impedance in particular. So um, uh, yeah, I think this the. It, it, it's a little bit hard to say. So typically, and uh, when we when we design the Doherty for uh, the PAs with the local contour, and uh, we we first need to look at what is the optimal load for the for the main PA when doing the power backoff, and uh, what is the optimal load with the main PA and all three PA together at the maximum of power, right? And that may not be exactly uh, half of the value because you know there are a lot of non idealities, and also I'm sure. And, the, and the, I'm sure you know that in reality, and we often design asymmetric authorities, right? The main auxiliary may not be symmetric. So all these things need to be uh, and the determined separately, and the, if, eventually the network needs to be co-optimized to hit the, and the, and the optimal impedance at different power levels. So that's, uh, yeah, that, that is actually more involved in optimization, I would say. Yeah. But the, one thing about the Doherty and the important thing is that uh, it's not only about the contours and uh, of the hitting the optimal load impedance, it's also about how we can ensure the correct turning on time of the auxiliary PAs so that we can achieve the both optimal back of the enhancement, but also the, and also the linearity. 
So therefore, often we need to design the, the, the IP biasing to facilitate the rapid turning on of the auxiliary PAs. And also that the biasing should be reconfigurable so that we can you know, really optimize the performance in reality. I hope that answers your question. Okay, um, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, once again, we are, uh, we're, we're happy and we're really pleased to have you do the uh, talk on the PA designs uh, on behalf of our chapter. We'd, we'd like to thank you so much. And I would like to hand off to Utkarsh for the closing remarks. Uh, thank you, uh, Venkara. So I will switch uh, to my screen, I guess. I have a few closing slides. Thank and... you. All right, can you guys see my screen? Yeah, we do. Okay, perfect. So uh, thank you very much, Professor. This was a marathon session. I know it's very odd hours for you in Europe. So uh, probably enough here for two or even multiple talks. We'll probably end up splitting this in two multiple videos. Uh, so thank you very much. This was uh, one of the best talks we did. And I just wanted to uh, post the statistics. So of the 1,143 people registered, we had 357 attend. This is more than twice our previous uh, peak. Uh, just goes to show the interest that folks have in this topic. And given all the questions and the very strong engagement, it probably makes sense to turn this uh, into a, a power amplifier series, you know, like given all the amazing work that you and others are doing in this field, I think there'll be a lot of interest to kind of uh, uh, make a series out of this. So I don't know how, whether you'd be interested in participating in this uh, further, but we'll definitely love to uh, have you engage more if you're interested, Professor. Absolutely, and uh, I'm happy to and, uh, you know, uh, participate in the, in the, the, we can put together a, a series program on this topic, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. And uh, so, yeah, like I said, this was like a record both in terms of registration and attendance. And uh, just wanna go on to the next slide here. Uh, okay, so just closing, I just wanna mention uh, congratulations again to the new officers who will be taking over. Uh, I'll continue to remain as an advisor uh, and probably we'll engage uh, with uh, uh, Professor Wang and others uh, and maybe turn this into a series because it seems like there's a lot of interest here. So uh, also, I just want to mention, we have our YouTube channel up and running. So this talk was recorded. We'll be sending out the links to the video and the slides to all registrants. So in the next couple of days, you should be receiving an email from us with links to the video and We'll be including the links to the new YouTube channel where we have uh, everything kind of organized by year and topics. So uh, you'll be getting links to that. And of course, uh, please, uh, if you're not a member yet, consider joining the IEEE uh, and also the MTTS, the Microwave Theory and Technic Society uh, so that we can continue to bring you such amazing talks uh, uh, in, such, in, in so many different fields. And of course, our, on LinkedIn, you can follow us on hashtag MTTSCV, and we'll be including this membership uh, benefit information uh, in the email that we send out as well. So, uh, so I'm very happy that uh, I'm able to hand off uh, things on such a high note. Uh, so wish you all uh, happy holidays and a safe and uh, prosperous new year ahead. And uh, uh, we'll, I guess we'll see you back here next year. So thanks again, Professor. Thank you, everybody. And uh, stay safe. Thank you. I also would like to thank the uh, Santa Clara the Valley chapter for organizing this uh, an excellent event. And I think this is um, and, uh, really fantastic. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for, for inviting me. And uh, I'm, I'm, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And also, I would like to thank the over 120 and the participants who are staying with us through this marathon talk and uh, all, yeah. all to the end. And I'm uh, <laughs> very impressed. And, uh, thank you for your interest. So, and uh, I, due to, again, <laughs> due to interest of time, and uh, I could not uh, address all the Q&As. And uh, so if you have additional questions, feel free to reach out to me and, uh, and we can discuss uh, offline. Happy to follow up. Thank you. Perfect. All right. Happy holidays uh, to everyone. Yeah. And with that, we'll close our proceedings and uh, uh, happy new year and uh, uh, stay safe. And we'll see you back here next year. Bye. Yeah. Bye.